Hey guys, welcome back. So now with our first talk with getting into Infinite Frontier, I think it would make sense for us that we start off with the Joker. Because prior to this point, we've talked a lot about Future State, which once again is like your timeline placeholder for your future of the DCU moving forward after Death Metal. But by no means are we done talking Future State. But in the process, I do want to talk about Infinite Frontier because Future State by design has a lot of cliffhangers to where on the other hand, Infinite Frontier with the Joker, it connects a lot of what we talked about with Nightwing, Red Hood, and also a little bit of what we mentioned with Dark Detective. And for that reason, I want to get into Infinite Frontier Joker for the sake of cohesiveness, if nothing else. <laughs> so let's get into it. But first, if you're new to the channel, be sure to subscribe to catch the spills every week. And don't forget to hit that bell up top so we can squat up in the comments for the first hour. Alright, so jumping in, we start off with a prologue that begins with your younger Jim Gordon, who in his earlier years he started in Gotham, but then he was transferred to Chicago by Captain Gillian Loeb, who at the time was a crooked captain, who wanted to get this new kid who was a good cop and who was honest and straightforward out of his way, which is why Jim Gordon got transferred to Chicago. And in this prologue, we get Jim Gordon thinking back to his last night in Chicago just before he had came back to Gotham, which he would describe as like a promotion and transferred to hell. But with Jim thinking back to his last night in Chicago, he remembers a conversation that he had with a guy by the name of Danny Ryan, who's an older gentleman to whom his father was more or less one of the legends of the Chicago PD around the time of your Al Capone era. But with Jim thinking back on this night and this conversation, he remembers Danny asking him if he was old enough to have gotten his boogeyman. And at first, Jim doesn't fully understand like what Danny means, but then Danny tells him that he's referring to that perp that you see when you close your eyes every night that was that one perp who was just always worse than all the others. And at this time in Jim's life, he's seen some things like he's been to war and he's seen active criminals in the streets, but Danny cuts him off and he tells Jim like, nah, you're too young. Because Danny tells him like when he refers to Boogeyman, he's not talking about either your common criminal or even your soldier who's doing what they believe they need to do for their country, but instead someone who does the unthinkable, but like for no reason at all. And initially Jim is like, okay, let me pick up your tab. You had a, a few too many, which Danny probably has. But then Danny tells Jim like, no, stop and listen, because Jim might learn something from this old man. And it's here where Danny asks Jim the question, does he believe in evil? And at the time, Jim responds like, yeah, sure. And like when Danny hears this, like the way that Jim responds, he immediately knows that Jim just hasn't seen it all yet. Because immediately after, Danny then goes on to tell Jim that when he was younger, around the age of Jim at this time, he had seen the devil himself. And he goes on to tell Jim the story of the time where he answered to a response, only to arrive at the scene to see this guy eating the face off of a 17 year old girl. And when Danny arrived, the dude was laughing hysterically. He tossed a piece to Danny. And after that, the guy got away out the fire escape. And initially, the story kind of catches Jim like, dude, why are you telling me this? But then it's here where Danny makes the point to Jim that he's telling him this because at the time, Danny said that he was much like Jim. He played things by the book and he tried to handle every situation according to the law. But it was that night for Danny that changed his mind. And because of that, Danny tells Jim that when it comes to the law, that there are some criminals you handle by the books. But when it comes to evil, you aim for the head. But with hearing this like at the time for Jim, he kind of dismissed it because he believed more often than not he would hear similar tellings from either crooked cops who would try to justify their actions. But for Jim, over time looking back at this conversation, he realizes that Danny wasn't trying to give him an explanation or justify any actions. But instead, Danny was giving Jim a warning of a boogeyman that he would eventually come around and face if he would just continue just keep on living. Which in the case of Jim Gordon, over the course of time, he found his boogeyman, which is the same face that keeps him up at night, who in his case is a joker, which then brings us to present day where Jim Gordon still has this issue. And even with saying that, like I can imagine, like if there was any defining moment when the joker had became Jim Gordon's boogeyman, that it had to be the killing joke. And not only because of the joker shooting his daughter, but also with the psychological torture that Jim had been put through at the time. <laughs> so in my opinion, if we had to pinpoint a date on it, or at least narrow it down to a time frame to where Jim had found his boogeyman, my vote is on the killing joke. But then after this, we jump forward into present day of the story, which takes us to Arkham Asylum right after A-Day. And so now like prior to this point, we've talked about the repercussions of A-Day with much of our talks within Future State, with Nightwing, with Red Hood and Dark Detective. But it really isn't till a few different issues within Infinite Frontier to where we get a closer look of what actually happened. And like it's here where Jim Gordon gives the recap of what had taken place. We find out that it was a deadly gas attack that killed nearly 500, counting patients, staff and security 
but also because of the scale of this event and it making United States history as the biggest deadliest gas attack, it had soon been known nationwide as A-Day. But also with getting into a few more of the details, we find out that the gas bombs they had went off at midnight and that this deadly toxin was a modified version of the original Joker toxin. But in this case, it was set with the intention to kill and as a result, there wasn't much of any laughing so people were just jokerized and dead. But amongst the few survivors, like one name stood out to Gordon and it was the name of a security officer by the name of Sean Mahoney who was able to save a few of the staff members by catching the release of the toxin early and he was successful by burning some of it out of the air for those who were nearby him. But with doing so he was injured severely but when Jim finds this out he also remembers that he denied Mahoney a spot on the police force six times during the time that Jim was commissioner and now after hearing what Mahoney had did during a day it really makes Jim question like his judgment of character but aside from this Jim also mentions that Batman he had arrived at the scene before the police and he was able to disperse the toxin from the air before they arrived but even with that being the case Mary Nakano still directed his men to arrest Batman due to the supposed lack of footage or evidence pointing elsewhere and this leaned more so into the reports that were saying that because of what Mahoney did with burning the toxin out of the air to try to save the staff and others that this had also burned and destroyed a lot of evidence and really all the police have at this time is like their listing of those presumed dead and some confirmed dead to where in this case Scarecrow and Jeremiah Arkham they're presumed dead but others like Bane have been confirmed but also like in the case of Bane like with confirmation of his death like he got a lot of love in the streets because he had a mural made for him in the little Santa Prisca and after his passing like in spite of what he's done a lot of people still looked at him as like a symbol of strength and most of this really just came from like your Latin American community who connected with Bane with many of them being from Santa Prisca and with Bane's passing you have your group of people who decided to make him a symbol but also like with this happening and Bane being one of the bodies who was confirmed like this was one of the few deaths that Gordon actually believed and because of that he also wanted the opportunity to examine Bane's body but even with doing so Gordon was denied not access. But then also on top of this, Gordon mentions that Mary Nakano, he's been doing some shifting around with the GCPD, which had mainly started after Joker War, after Harvey Bullock had stepped down as commissioner. And since that time, Mayor Nakano, he's been stepping in and out of the commissioner role, but it was three days after A-Day to where Nakano had reached out to Gordon, and with doing so, showing Gordon that there's footage of the Joker leaving the asylum months prior to where they believed that the Joker had planted these gas bombs with the intention of sending them off at a later date. But when Mayor Nakano showed these to Gordon he just kind of nodded like he had, hadn't seen him before because with the mayor showing Gordon these pictures three days after Gordon had already been looking over a lot of these images with Batman two days ago but with Gordon not wanting to be involved with Nakano he then asked the mayor to reconsider his stance on Batman and with doing so knowing that the mayor is not gonna budge and more so using that questioning to kind of shut him up and tell him no at the same time but Gordon turns it down rather than working on it and having his hands tied but also even aside from that Gordon is just at the point in his life where he's ready to move forward but even aside from Gordon meeting with the mayor he had also got a message from Harvey Bullock to where Harvey had pitched the idea of both of them going into private investigation together but Gordon didn't want to take that route either because for Gordon he remembers cheating on his first wife with Sarah Singh and because of that he knows that good people can make mistakes and because of that he doesn't want to be a private investigator to where he makes a living off of catching good people when they're down but on top of this, like for Gordon, in conversations with his daughter Barbara, she often tells him that he just needs to close his eyes and just picture the future that he wants for himself, whether it's what he wants to do next or how he sees himself retiring. But for Gordon, when he closes his eyes, like the only thing he hears is laughter. And when he opens his eyes, it's not too much different because of the whole situation with Punchline, with her being arrested after Joker War, and a lot of the kids in the streets being inspired by Punchline and wearing her name on their t-shirts, and in some cases even dressing up like the Joker or Punchline in order to intimidate others while committing crimes. But like also with this being the case, it makes me think like, you know, not long ago I had Punchline and Joker as like wallpapers on my desktop. <laughs> and I just want to say my bad, Gordon. <laughs> sorry, not sorry. But then also from here we jump over to one of those frequent conversations which Gordon has with his daughter Barbara. But between the two of them most of the conversation is like Barbara trying to help her father and get him towards the idea of retirement. But for Gordon he has a tough time even having these conversations because for Gordon he likes the idea and he would like to retire and just leave and move to somewhere warm. But financially Gordon barely has enough money to retire in his own apartment for another year or two. And on top of that like Gordon even thinks about it. It's almost like he can hear the Joker leaning 
bending over and laughing at his situation. But then also like just to give a bit more context to this, because with Barbara trying to help her father figure these things out, like for her this may also be coming from a place of guilt. And I say this because closer to around the time of the Joker War, or more so leaning up to the Joker War, back when we talked about the Joker paying Barbara another visit, like not long after that had taken place, you had also had this instance to where someone was seducing women who had looked like Batgirl and with doing so matching her height, matching her weight, and were close enough to her age, but more or less they would pass for Batgirl once in the costume. Well, with Barbara going through with this investigation, she had found out that this was being done by her brother, James Gordon Jr. And it was pretty sad how it played out because on one hand, James Gordon was actually trying to do better. And even at one point on his own, he was trying to help Barbara so that she wouldn't become the next victim of this person who's killing redheads. But because of James's condition, he had then developed dual personalities to where on one side it had very much went back to the serial killer and the other was more of your recent James Gordon Jr. who we had seen more recently who had sincerely wanted to do better. And with this better side being jealous of his sister and the attention that she got from their father, which the better James figured that's something he'll deal with and move forward. But his darker half, like the other side of his duality, he had started creating and killing bad girls in order to make the good side of James feel better. And it was a crazy reveal because when Barbara found this out, both Jameses started talking to each other and they figured out that Barbara was Batgirl and with Barbara trying to help him out. And mind you, like at this point, Barbara didn't care that he figured it out. And in James's effort to protect Barbara and their family, he told her that stopping this evil himself was the only way, which was like a real tragic ending for the character of James Gordon Jr. Because you guys know, like you guys that have been rocking with me for a while, you already know, like I wanted James Gordon Jr., like his narrative to kind of lean into like the dark hero, which is where it felt like it was going for a while. But unfortunately at the time, it just led to a tragic ending. But also when this happened, Gordon, he had blamed Batgirl with her being there at the time. And also in a sense, Barbara had blamed herself. But really all in all, it was just a tragic situation that still has its lingering effects on the both of them to this day. And it's why I say I believe that Barbara, she's helping her father, not just because it's her father and she wants the best for him, which I believe she does. But I also believe there's an underlying amount of guilt there as well. With Barbara feeling guilty for having gone through certain things, whether they were the prior attacks of the Joker and these challenges made her stronger versus the things that James dealt with from his childhood, which he had to deal with his entire life. But for Jim, like when he later visits his son's grave and he thinks of these comparisons which James had made between himself and his sister, and it causes him not only to think back on how the Joker pushed things over the edge with the ways that the Joker has affected this family's life from different angles, but for Jim, he also sees this as a Joker laughing over the grave of James as well. But in addition to this for Jim, like leaving his son's gravesite, he's then confronted by this wealthy woman and her muscle who looks like he's straight out of the Resident Evil franchise. But with confronting Jim, she tells him to get in the car so they can discuss business concerning the Joker. And Jim, he doesn't really argue. He just gets in the car and more or less, he's kind of like, hey, my life, it figures. <laughs> but with talking to this mysterious lady, she then takes Jim to a mansion, which he believes is hers. But she tells him like, nope, it's not mine and I'm not telling you whose it is because pertaining to the business that they're here to speak of, she wants to keep most of it as confidential as possible. And when Jim asks like, at least like, what do I address you by? She then tells him that he can just call her Cressida. But when Jim points to the muscle and he's like, well, what about him? Cressida's then like, well, you don't call him anything. <laughs> and I tell you right now, Jim's better than me because I would have just called him Nemesis and left it at that. And dude would have chased me out of the mansion and that would have been the end of it right there. <laughs> But from here where Cressida opens the conversation, she gives Jim a few pictures of the Joker that were taken in Belize a few weeks ago. And this plane had originally been chartered from this private airfield outside of Gotham, which also belongs to the friends of her family to whom the identity of Cressida does not want to disclose. Because even prior to this happening, these private jets weren't to be known of by the government, which is why she's approaching Jim with this proposition anyway. But with Jim hearing this and seeing these pictures, for him, this is all new information. The mayor doesn't have this up Date, which immediately lets him know she hasn't gone to the police. But then on top of that, Jim also knows that Batman isn't aware of this as well, but he doesn't bring up the Batman part. But with showing Jim this information, Cressida lets him know that the people that she works for, that they want the Joker taken out for good. And for that reason, they called her to reach out to Jim Gordon because he has more experience than anyone in hunting the Joker. And on top of that, the motivation to see this job through as well, with the Joker nearly killing Barbara and instigating the death of his son, James. But even with this, like Jim 
admits that he is capable of tracking down the Joker, but he lets her know he's not just gonna drop everything and fly to Belize. But then it's here where Cressida really hits him, because she tells Jim that she knows that Jim's not in the best situation financially, and that for him, a retirement plan is pretty much non-existent. And it's here where she tells him that upon his trip, he'll be given a car with unlimited funds, and as far as the job, upon completion, $25 million will be deposited within his bank account. And when Jim hears this, it gets his attention, so he's like, okay, just to be clear, you want me to capture the Joker and bring him back to Gotham for $25 million. But then Cressida's like, oh no, no. Like if we just wanted a bounty and somebody to grab him and bring him back to the States, we would have just called the police. And it's here where she makes it clear as day to Jim that they want him to kill the Joker. And it's crazy because like initially when Jim hears this, he expresses like what a lot of us are probably thinking, like with the fact that he's a former police commissioner. But then on top of that, like the fact that he's not a hitman. But Cressida then goes further to tell him that these are some of the reasons why he's perfect for the job. And on top of that, with his unique history with the Joker, she also believes that he's more qualified than a hitman to actually get this done. And after saying this, like when Jim asks her, like, why do you believe I would say yes to this? She then asks Jim, does he believe in evil? And this time, without hesitation, he says, yes, I do. Which shows us like right off the bat, like Jim, the older Jim, he sees the world much differently than the younger Jim Gordon leaving Chicago. But then it's here where Cressida tells him that he doesn't have to decide right away. But in the event that Jim decides to take this job, then he could prevent the Joker from coming back and continuing the cycle of chaos which he's done over the years time and time again. And in the case of Jim, instead of just leaving behind the position of commissioner, just knowing that Gotham's gonna fall into this same cycle again, he now has the choice to agree to her terms and do something that'll change Gotham forever, and on top of that, get the retirement that she says he deserves. But then on top of this, we then jump over to Belize, and not so much as a sign that Jim took the job, like the screen flips and you see Jim just dancing out in Belize, but instead in this case, we're kind of shown what's going on over there in the meantime. But heading over there, we do get a bit Bit more narration from Jim and he talks about how like in the case of Danny Ryan who had asked Jim the question years ago if he believed in evil and Jim thinks back on how the story of Danny Ryan ended which had pretty much concluded with Danny Ryan taking his own life after years of obsessing of trying to catch the killer he had seen that night which had only led to a number of dead ends and it eventually drove Danny insane and at this point Jim Gordon's thinking over these things likely to the notion of deciding whether or not he's going to take this job because deep down inside he also knows like where this manhunt could lead like if he were to take this job never find the joker and eventually lose his mind and end up like danny ryan and while gordon is thinking this over we then find that this whole setting in belize is in fact where the joker is to where at this point he's murdered more people taken their home and he's just reading the gotham gazette catching up with all the details post a day all right, so when we jump back in, we're very much in the headspace of Jim Gordon to where at this time he is very much thinking about the offer from Cressida for him to head down to Belize and kill the Joker for $25 million. And though like in the front of his mind, he wants to say no, but like any human being, he goes through the justification process before fully coming to any decision. But this time around, he's not so much thinking about the reasons that he should kill the Joker like before, like with the Joker causing Jim to lose his son James or what the Joker's done to Barbara or even the times where he's tortured Jim for that matter. And really, like when you're making a list of reasons of why to kill the Joker, that list will go on for days. But in this case, at this point, Jim is now thinking about the money. And with thinking this over, he kind of poses the question, like, have you ever asked yourself, like, how much does the rest of your life cost? Because that's something that Gordon has thought about for as long as he could remember, whether it was moving to Gotham with a young daughter, trying to figure out how much a small apartment would cost. And then on top of that, considering how much would he need to put his daughter through school? And then on top of that, how much would he need for the next child that's on the way? So for Gordon, with him thinking about Cressida's offer, it really just re-stirs up a conversation that this man has been having with himself for years. And even though Gordon's solutions have kind of been like, well, okay, well, after commissioner, I'll become something like captain or land some type of respectable position that will make more money. But even with having these ideas, the bills would just keep stacking up. And he even mentions at a time with his old partner, Arnold Flass, who was a crooked cop who offered Gordon ways to make money by bending the law. But of course, as we know, Gordon's answer was no. But when times got hard, he'd admit that he would think of that offer as like a card up his sleeve. And a lot of the time, it was those moments of weakness that would cause him like, to excuse himself from the dinner table and stand outside and have a smoke in that cold outdoor air in order to harden his resolve and bring his mind back in. And where we pick up with Gordon in this moment while he's thinking through these thoughts, 
it's outside on the fire escape of his current apartment where he's waiting for Batman to arrive so he can give Batman the most recent update. And with doing this, it does take Batman a bit longer than it would have back at the police station when Gordon was commissioner and he had the huge spotlight to put the bat signal on. So it's like now with him having a flashlight with the symbol drawn on it just shining through the window of his apartment, the response time for Batman just isn't as quick. Not to mention, this isn't too long after Joker War. So on Batman's end, he's not moving around as quickly as he would have before. But when he gets there, Jim tells him mostly everything. Cause he tells Batman about Cressida and her silent chauffeur, air quotes. And he tells Batman that the Joker is in Belize and Cressida is offering 25 million for Gordon to go after him with the use of a credit card that has absolutely no spending limit. But Gordon does not lay out the detail that Cressida and whoever she's working with that they want Gordon to kill the Joker. And Gordon doesn't share that bit of information cause at this point, he wants to, and though he hasn't decided like the absolute that he will kill the Joker, but he definitely wants to take this job and save that final decision for that time when the opportunity lends itself. But with Gordon not telling Batman that they want him to kill the Joker, he doesn't tell Batman here because if he did, then that would be like his invitation to have Batman talk him out of it, and Gordon does not want to be talked out of it. And with giving Batman these details, like he asked Gordon, like, do you want to do this? And Gordon answered honestly, he said yes. And Batman lets him know like he would rather do this himself, but because of the recent attack on Arkham, which has pretty much reopened the wound from the Joker war on Gotham, and because of that like Bruce can't just drop what's happening here and head to Belize. But then he expresses that he's at least glad that at least someone he can trust is heading to Belize to handle this. But even still, he knows good and well that Gordon didn't just call him over there just so Gordon could get Batman's approval. And even with Bruce picking this up, like Gordon even calling Batman in may even be a way of Gordon trying to say, hey, pull me back a little bit. But instead, when Batman mentions this, Gordon's like, you know what? I do need something. Matter of fact, I need a few things. In the first, like he wants Batman to find out who Cressida is and who she's working for. Secondly, Gordon wants access to a database that won't flag the police, which in other words is just a level of access to the back computer. And when Gordon asked Batman this, like Batman, his facial expression gave Gordon the look of like when your girl asked to go through your phone. But Gordon scales his back, like he lets Batman know that he can keep the parental controls on it. But Gordon wants access to like the Joker's contacts or any information about international allies or perhaps even other aliases that the Joker's used so that Gordon can fill in the blanks with solid intel from the night that the Joker first appeared in Gotham all the way up till present day. And at first, Batman's kind of like, okay, let me think about the best way to do this. But right away, Gordon's like, look, I'm not done. Because he then tells Batman that he needs a way to reach him. And then Batman's like, what, you want my phone number? But Gordon admits that he'll feel better knowing that Batman has a way to keep tabs on him while he's out in Belize. And in the event that he needs to contact Batman, he'd like to have something better than a flashlight. But with hearing this, like Batman, he agrees with all the requests, but he only asks for one thing in exchange. And the one thing that he asks is that when Gordon finds the Joker, that he doesn't move in, but instead he calls Batman first so that he can come down and capture the Joker safely. And that way the two of them can bring the Joker Joker back to Gotham together. And when saying this, he asked Gordon to promise that he wouldn't go against the Joker alone. And Gordon's response was like, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> And with doing this, like Batman tells Gordon, you're not going alone and I'm sending you a chaperone. So he calls up Oracle, who of course has been listening this whole time. And she tells Batman this is a dumb idea. Gordon is going to get himself killed. But then she also points out that Gordon didn't make the promise. Like he did not promise that he would not approach the Joker by himself. And when this happens, like for Gordon to avoid the whole conversation of, are you really trying to kill the Joker? He instead throws them a twist and he mentions Barbara's name, admitting now for the first time that he actually knows that Barbara is Oracle and Batgirl, which is a change that we gotta talk about in a little bit. But with doing this, Gordon is using it just as a distraction. But with him saying it, he can't help but smile because now he has the world's greatest detective thinking like, what else does this guy know? And when this happens, Barbara then tells her father to meet her at the clock tower ASAP, which of course is a meeting that Batman just can't help him with. But then it's here where we jump down to Belize to where the Joker is still chilling in the home to where he had killed the previous residents of. And at this time, he's approached by a man by the name of Desmond who works with an international criminal resort system called The Network. And as far as The Network, which is like a series of hidden getaway spots all around the world, which were initially established for Nazi war criminals out of World War II, but over time they switched their clientele to top players in organized crime and not from the public set 
but the private players. And time to time, what the network would do is like they would host a huge villain, you know, someone like the Joker, and let him stay for free in order to raise the price for future clients later on, letting them know like, oh, well, you know, the Joker stayed here. The resort is top notch. Nobody found him. And if you want our services or locations, then you're going to have to pay the premium. But then here's the thing with this Desmond guy showing up, because when he arrives here, he tells the Joker that this location is not one of ours. And these people that you killed, they're not our clients, but they were some of our wealthiest neighbors. And on top of that, they were pretty significant and they're going to be hard to make disappear. And because of that, Desmond asked the Joker to leave the country immediately or be dragged out of this home and fed the dogs. But of course, the Joker tells him no to either option and he then lets him in on a third because the Joker didn't just randomly pick this place for no reason. Because when he asked Desmond if he's aware of what happened in Arkham, Desmond's like, yes. And the Joker tells him like, because of what happened at Arkham, people are going to be heading down to Belize looking for him. And the Joker doesn't go into the details of who, because though he doesn't know exactly who, he has his suspicions and he's pretty sure they're going to be right. But then it's here where he tells him like the reason why the Joker had picked this house is because he created a trail for someone to follow him 13 miles southwest of this location of which also this house has the high ground. But as far as the other home where the Joker's trail leads to, he just tells Desmond that he can send 30 men, put them in the trees and have them kill whoever comes out there looking for him. But with the Joker doing this and making these provisions, like not only does he keep the fight away from Desmond's business, but it's also like the Joker is cashing in on a favor that he's been doing for the network for so many years. With the Joker showing up at so many of their locations and the network making a lot of money off of the Joker's name. But from here, he pretty much just tells Desmond to get the place cleaned up because the corpse have been sitting around but then also the joker tells him to make sure that the housekeeping brings him some fresh threads so he can get to work but then after this it's here where we get to the talk between jim and barbara because when jim goes to meet his daughter at the clock tower like she asked he shows up bringing her hot chocolate smart man she loves hot chocolate but initially with them going into this conversation barbara's kind of like okay let's walk and talk but just to be clear like this whole thing of jim gordon knowing that his daughter is batgirl slash oracle this is new but it's handled well because once they start getting into the talk of like barbara's implant and how the doctors have recommended that she takes it easy or the implant just won't be effective anymore but then it's here where barbara goes into what jim had said to batgirl at the time of james's death which we talked about in the previous video which which was essentially Jim telling Batgirl that he was going to hold her accountable for James's death, which is a pretty heavy thing to say if you know that's your daughter. But the retcons handle smoothly, like Tanyan holds it together here because Jim then explains that he was more angry or upset at himself when he said that and he lashed out. And when Barbara tries to tell him like he can't blame himself for the death of James, it's here where he lets her know like he hears that concept, but even still he can't help but hear the Joker still laughing at him. And Barbara tells him like she hears the same thing too. But even still, she wants her father to know that going after the Joker is practically suicide. And on top of that, like he doesn't even know who he's working for doing this. And if the money's the issue, like the last thing she's going to do is let her father live on the street. And when she says this, it's right here. Boom. Where Gordon just tells her, like Cressida wants me to go down there and kill the Joker. And as soon as he says it, she's like, you didn't tell Batman that. And Gordon's like, no, and I would prefer that you don't either. And from there, Barbara kind of puts things together and she tells her father like you're considering it and when he responds like i'm not considering it and after there's like this moment of silence but at that point it's like yo this, he's decided that he wants to kill the joker he's decided and from there when barbara brings up like events from the killing joke with her being shot and her father being tortured nearly into insanity and how even after all that gordon asked batman to bring in the joker by the books and right there jim just cuts her off like that is the exact point because even after that like what good did it do us because on Barbara's end, she understands that the Joker has taken a lot from their family. And if Jim goes down to Belize after the Joker, he's then given the Joker the chance to take what's left, which is like the time that they have between the father and daughter. But the way that Gordon sees it, like if he just leaves the Joker out there or if he locks him up and does it by the books again, who's to say that the next time around, he won't just kill Barbara. And at this point, Jim's just like, you know what? I'll make a deal with you. And he tells his daughter like he won't actually kill the Joker unless he can convince Barbara that it's the right thing to do. And if he can't do that, then he'll just do it Batman's way. Which to me very much sounds like Jim is just saying what people need to hear with a whole lot of I'll justify this as I go type of energy. But then it's here where they go back to the clock tower and Barbara gives her father a phone, which is red like the old school bat phone, but a cellular version, of course. And she tells him that the phone is red so that he doesn't lose it like he did the last one. So there's that. 
but in this case it's invisible to all cellular networks and is connected to Batman's personal satellite, giving him a direct line to Barbara and she'll patch him into Batman when needed. But then also through this phone, Gordon will have access to the Bat computer, but only to the extent of information relative to the Joker, so he's not just swiping through the Bat computer like for hours on end. But with giving him this phone, Barbara tells him that first he needs to read through the files in relation to A-Day, because there were a lot of people in Arkham who were killed in the A-Day attack who had powerful family and friends. And for that reason, it's in Gordon's best interest to start here so he can see if there's any ties leading back to Cressida. But then it's here where we jump around to a few different locations. Because since the A-Day attack had hit the news, a number of friends and relatives, they had got that news with them having either a little brother or somebody that they knew who was locked up in Arkham and killed at the time of the attack. And with it being believed that the Joker pulled off this attack, he is the primary target to these friends or these family members of the inmates who were victim. Because first we go over to Hooper County, Texas, to the Samson family who has this huge mansion with a round table and an empty chair for a member of their family who was locked up in Arkham by the name of Billy who was killed in the A-Day attack. And when we go here, we see that they have plans to get the Joker bring him to Texas in order to cook him and eat him and all in honor of the Samson family. But then after this, we then head over to Santa Prisca to where we find this group that has been unnamed, but then clearly off of like their face mask and the location is like these dudes were clearly fans of Bane. But in this case, on the topic of the numerous people who are going to be coming after the Joker, we now come to find out that this group has created a new version of Bane to hunt down the Joker and kill him for the revenge of Bane's death, which is kind of messed up because they don't really know who's truly behind all this. But then after this, we then go to Gotham City where we see Cressida who has been working with the Court of Owls this whole time. And when she meets with them, they address her as Miss Clark, but they also let her know like with the work that she's put in, it's clearing her family's name within the ledger. But because of the work that she put in and her sending Gordon on a flight in the next morning to go to Belize, the Court of Owls then allow her to retake her family's seat on the council, which finally shows us not only who she was referring to as far as friends or as family or even quote unquote client, but it also informs us of her last name and her motive of redemption for herself and her actual family in restoring their place on the council of the Court of Owls. Alright, so just out the gate, we start off with a flashback taking us back to the killing joke when the Joker had abducted James Gordon, stripped him naked, and taken him to Amusement Mile. And with Jim Gordon thinking back on this night, he's going over a number of things about the Joker just before he catches his flight to Belize. And it's very much needed for a few reasons, with the first being obvious as far as preparation, but then with the next two just really honing in on Amusement Mile and the significance to this location with Jim Gordon ever since that night. And he even mentions like to the day he can feel that leather collar still digging into his neck he can smell the sweat of the circus sideshow acts he remembers asking like what am i doing here and he remembers the devil or the joker responding and with thinking back on this night just thinking about it he remembers the joker's intention of driving him crazy and not only that but also how the joker had staged it out so well because when jim gordon was dragged into amusement mile he asked the Joker, what am I doing here? And the Joker responded, you're doing what any sane man would be doing here. In these circumstances, you're going mad. And when Gordon thinks back on this and how the Joker had planned it out so well, he thinks back and he remembers it like in these three steps. And it's like, first the Joker, he like just sees into your soul and somehow he just knows what you're thinking. And before you can decide to either say it or not say it, he just blurts it out. Just like when he told Gordon he was going mad. And even if you don't want to accept it, you start to believe it because you were already thinking it and he said it. And with him continuing to speak the things that are on your mind, Next, his cold shark eyes just look through you, making you feel transparent and small. And then the third and final thing that would actually break you would then be his laugh. Because after everything that's happened, there's then this sense of self-satisfaction that the Joker gets in your torment. And that is the same laughter that Jim Gordon hears to this day. And when we go back to present day, like it's here where we see that Jim Gordon, he's actually physically at Amusement Mile. And like I mentioned earlier, as far as Gordon's three reasons for going over all these things about the Joker, with the first being for the preparation and the last two really dealing with this location. And the second is that Gordon mentions here that this is the night that changed his perspective on the Joker. Because before he thought the Joker was just some crazy clown who just wanted attention and he would actually get angry at Batman 
Batman for prioritizing the Joker rather than different organized crime groups. But for Gordon, that night during the killing joke, like that was the night everything changed and he quickly realized that the Joker wasn't no joke. But then also the third thing is like Gordon knew that the Joker's intention was to drive him mad. But Gordon said that didn't work and he showed Batman that he wasn't broken and some time later he did the same for his daughter. But with Gordon coming here now in the present day, it's almost like he's returning for himself to prove to himself that he hasn't gone mad. But even yet and still to this day, he still hears the Joker laughing. And I mean, I'm no psychiatrist or anything, but that's one of the moments where you just start writing on the clipboard because that symptom's not okay. But after this, Gordon then makes his way to the airport to meet up with Cressida, who's giving him a private flight to Belize. And when he sees her, he admits that he's a little uneasy about the situation, but Cressida just kind of brushes it off like, now nah, you got this big dog. <laughs> but as far as the arrangement with Gordon going down there, Cressida's providing his private flight to where he'll arrive at the same airport that the Joker landed at, to where from there, she has a list of off the book resorts that she wants going in to check out but then as far as his way back he's supposed to fly commercial but if at that point he feels like he's looking over his shoulder then she'll make arrangements to move him from different countries before he gets back but as far as guns Cressida then lets him know like that part's gonna be a little difficult but then Gordon's like he has that part covered he has a handgun in his suitcase so she doesn't need to bother and so after this Cressida then hands him the black car because it got no limit <laughs> And that had me thinking like, don't send him down there with Usher Bucks, man. Now, now that'd be a real joke. But when she hands Gordon the card, he does crack a little joke like, okay, like what if I just took this money and just went on a vacation? And when he says this, Cressida gives him this wide eye look and she's like, I don't know, Mr. Gordon. What if you did? But we know that pretty much translates to she's gonna send her dude Nemesis or Mr. X, whatever you wanna call him, because he got vibes from either Resident Evil villain. But she knows that Gordon knows better than to just take these good people money and run with it. But with him getting on board, she does tell him that she would like for him to treat himself a bit, like when he gets there and get a big room with a nice view. But all in all, she tells Gordon that she believes that he's a good man and he's going to do the job that they paid him to do. And so when Gordon gets on board, he tries to make conversation with the mysterious silent muscle guy, but he stays in character, like he don't say nothing. But when Big Man heads to the cockpit, Gordon then pulls out the Bat Phone Pro Max and he lets Barbara know that he's wheels up and now making his way to Belize. But also at this time with Barbara sitting in the Oracle role, as of recently, she has a lot more time for this. Cause like we talked about before, the chip in her back, it's been through a lot and like Joker War alone. Like you might as well have pulled that chip out and played Domino with it. Like it's nearly done. But as far as her getting help with doing the legwork, she also has Spoiler and Black Bat taking care of what she needs like out in the field while Barbara just locks in so she can find out who Cressida actually is. Which all we really know at this point is that Cressida is working with the Court of Owls and with her arranging the Joker's death, she'll then have her family's name cleared in the ledger. But after this, when we jump back to Jim Gordon in route to Belize, to where at this time he's sorting out all this information on the Joker. But as he's doing this, he gives this example of how sorting out this information for the Joker, it's very different than doing this for like your common criminal or your conventional murderer even. And when we see him going through his process and getting this information together, like we see like going through his mind, he thinks of other detectives who will do it the wrong way, the lazy way. Like when a wife is killed and they just pin it on the husband because that's usually what they find it to be and they don't want to do the legwork. But for Gordon, he's thorough. He takes the time to do it, which he really has at this time on a five hour flight. But also with navigating him through this process, he puts a very heavy emphasis on using his gut. Because when you do this for a while, you can nearly play back the conversations from the crime scene in your mind. But also at times there are exceptions to the rules and things aren't exactly what they seem. But also while Gordon is on his way to Belize, we then hop over to a different commercial flight heading to Belize to where on this flight we see the Samson family who in the last issue was talking about catching the Joker and eating him but here we catch him on a commercial flight disguised as flight attendants and stealing the plane to get to the Joker but then also in addition we see the female Bane who had recently had a version of the Venom formula put into her bloodstream and she's now making her way down to Belize from Santa Prisca. But then after this, when Gordon touches down, we then get a look into like his breaking down of the logic of where the Joker would be and like how he even plans to get into the mind of the Joker 
and shadow his steps to his current location. And it really just starts with Gordon going to his hotel and him putting his information with concepts that he's been thinking of about the Joker for years. Like for instance, when the Joker goes quiet and he's not terrorizing Gotham, Gordon more or less thinks of that as like Joker's hibernating time until all of a sudden where he decides to just blow up a circus or something. But Gordon also figures like if the Joker's at one of these resorts on the list that he was given by Cressida, then his performance hasn't ended, he has an audience, and the Joker's gonna do something to test the limits of that resort and when he does people are gonna be missing but also in that case you're like with these resort chains you're dealing with the wealthy and powerful who are also good at covering their tracks from the wealthy and powerful so instead of Gordon going to every single hotel and asking these questions that will make it obvious why he's here he instead makes his rounds around town and he makes conversation with people who work at these resorts while being careful to not be obvious about who he's looking for but instead while in conversation he pays attention to certain things that they're afraid to talk about which for him narrows down the location so then when he hears about a missing businessman in that area that then tells Gordon where he needs to start and Gordon also admits like in the case of this guy missing on top of the situation with the house nearby with the incident that nobody wants to talk about like he admits that connecting these two like it could be a stretch and it could be a coincidence and for Gordon after talking to a bunch of these guys who work in service he just figures why not try one of these spots where he believes that the Joker was about a month ago because why not this will likely give him a lead to the joker's next move so he checks out this spot he knocks on the door and this is the exact house that the joker is still in after what we had seen in the last issue with the joker making arrangements with desmond to where his men would protect joker in a house nearby because the joker was expecting a number of people to come out here looking for him but in the case of jim gordon like when the joker opened this door like the look on his face he literally looked like he shit himself but even still with having that reaction like the fight or flight kicked in and gordon drawed his gun and in this moment he pretty much had to make that decision but like we'd seen the joker was prepared for this like he knew a party was coming to his doorstep so he made plans and he took advantage of the wealthy and powerful quote unquote so that while everyone's coming down here looking for him he also has a small army covering his hide but with Gordon having his gun drawn on the Joker and the Joker having a number of guns drawn on Gordon, he now has to make the decision to either kill the Joker now and die doing it or let this opportunity slip through his fingers so he might live to get another one. And when this happening, Gordon, he chooses to live and I don't blame him. But then when he does this, the Joker pulls him to the side and he tells Gordon like he showed up just in time and all of this is too grisly to go down without an audience. And when Gordon asks him like, what are you talking about? And it's here where the Joker tells Jim Gordon what we've known Known for some time now which is that the Joker did not bomb Arkham but instead somebody else did and they wanted everyone to think that it was the Joker and that's why any minute now a number of different people are making their way down to Belize to try and kill him and the Joker tells Gordon like these people are gonna be here any minute because there's one group who's already taken out the men who he had up in the trees and there's another group making their way up the hill right now and with the Joker knowing all this like it even goes to show like what Gordon was talking about as far as the conversations between the wealthy and the powerful and this is just an example to where in the case of the Joker he really doesn't need to squeeze the information out of anyone and because he's constantly putting on a show which in his case are like his insane antics but with him constantly putting on that show he'll get that information from somebody before things even get worse or they end up a part of his next joke but with gordon finding all of this out and like just getting here at the last minute like this new information totally flips everything on its head and i'm pretty sure he still wants to kill the joker but for now he's kind of forced to team up with him at least to live through the day because for everyone else who's coming here gordon is pretty much just guilty by association all right, so when we jump back in with Jim Gordon, who at this point has found the Joker, and with doing so, only realizing, like with the Joker telling him, that he wasn't the one who caused A-Day, which like I mentioned before, like it's one of those things you just take the Joker at his word for. Because when you confront the Joker, regardless of how you find him, whether his back's against the wall or whatever, like he's gonna own up to everything he did. But on top of Gordon getting this fresh news, he also showed up just in time for the everybody thinks the Joker did it, so let's get him party. And amongst those heading in, 
We have this female Bane character who James Tynion has given us a bit more information about since letting us know that this is the daughter of Bane who goes by the name Vengeance, which is an appropriate name with her believing that the Joker killed her father. But sooner or later, I assume that she's going to find out that it wasn't him. And at that point, she'll need to redirect her vengeance. But with where this is going and how it's starting for her, like I'm digging it because for the most part, with everything that we've seen from her, it's been very little dialogue, which in some cases, I feel like it tells a stronger or more effective story because for her it just gives off the vibes that she's here for business and even from the first time that we'd seen her like in issue two to where at the time most of the commentary was like gordon going over his thoughts after getting the offer from cressida but while we're seeing that we're also seeing the makings of this beast with us seeing the journey of vengeance starting in santa prisca where she had taken the newer version of the venom formula which mixed well with her bloodstream to no surprise because i mean her daddy been on that stuff for years so she's a venom baby <laughs> at least to some degree before taking it. But with the quiet buildup in this mysterious group that's around her, who are all clearly showing some form of admiration to her father, with the masks and with the location. But even then, like with the little dialogue that we did get, they had asked her at one point if she knows who her enemy is, and all she had said is Joker. And when we saw that, we knew, okay, right off the bat, this is serious. And then after that, fast forward to now, where at this point the Joker has told Jim Gordon that one of the groups heading this way, they've already taken out his men in the trees. And when we jump over to Vengeance, it's like here where we see how that played out. Because when the Joker's men saw Vengeance approaching with her soldiers, they had opened fire, but then Vengeance punched the tree, knocking the Joker's men out of it, only to then kick down the tree, impale them with it, and then stomp on their heads. Which I imagine at that point just has the soldiers who are with her like, why are we here? <laughs> like, you got this lady, I'm gonna be way in the back. But with this happening and Vengeance stunting like her daddy so to speak, she makes her way closer to the house that the Joker's in and she picks up one of these soldiers who fell out the tree and used them as a human shield. But if you ask me, like that's not even the worst part of like this piece right here because this guy probably survived the landing from falling from the tree because he's not the one who got his head stomped. But for this guy, it's the fact of after falling out the tree, he had then taken a headshot from his own team. So when Vengeance picked him up as a shield, like dude was already gone anyway. But then after using this guy to charge into the others, she then tears the rest of them apart limb by limb. But like, this is what I'm talking about with her being a few words, but with just seeing the action, it tells you better than anything she could say that her determination just runs deep and even on top of that like the few words that she does say they hit a lot different because she's not just here to discuss anything but after running through these soldiers she gets a visual on the joker who's up on like the infinity glass balcony she yells joker and next thing you know she's in his face and when she was approaching like the joker was like what's black white and red all over but she was just so fast the joker was like okay i'm gonna put a pin in that joke and i'm gonna let security do their job for a little bit but then not too far behind you have jim gordon watching all of this happen and while he's watching it he's really having this moment of like hey i could kill the joker nobody would know like how would they know nobody would know but also with the joker in his sights he thinks over like the lies that we tell ourselves as adults in order to justify what we believe needs to be done and gordon admits that over the years he's gotten very good at this from being a cop to commissioner and telling himself that everything he was doing was making the world better but a lot of that changed after the joker shot his daughter and tried to drive him insane because even though he tried to appear strong for his daughter and everyone else but when he looked in the mirror he seen himself as someone who was reaching for something that was intangible and in this moment where he has the chance to kill the joker like this whole process just runs through his mind all over again because on one hand he's thinking like if i squeeze how would barbara know with all the commotion that went down here today and if gordon does this he can just collect that 25 mil and stop hearing the joker laugh at him every night before he goes to sleep but ultimately gordon decides that he's not gonna do it but instead he'll regroup with barbara and they'll figure out who really caused a day but as soon as gordon changes his mind and he turns around like getting ready to leave one of desmond's men they catch Gordon because Mr. Desmond wants to have a talk with Gordon about how exactly he found them here which as we know if others can do the same then it's just bad for business but in the middle of this guy talking to Gordon a tour bus just comes crashing through and like we had seen before this is the arrival of Vicky and Buddy Sampson from the Sampson family who had made their way here to get revenge for Billy Sampson who had died in the Arkham attack after being locked up in Arkham for the past 30 years. But with them showing up here in Vengeance already having her paws on the Joker, the Sampson family, they wanna take the Joker back to Texas so they can eat him, while Vengeance, she wants to take the Joker to Santa Prisca so that her and the others can perform his execution. And because of that, there's a bit of a standoff here like, up, oh, who's gonna take him? But then the Joker, he then takes this opportunity to finish his joke from earlier when he had mentioned what's black and white and red all over 
over to where he then lets him know it's the canisters for the nerve gas that he had planted all around the house. And the Joker, he even goes as far to explain it like, you know, I had to go and paint the canisters so it would make sense with the punchline of the joke. And from there, he just laughs hysterically while Vengeance gets out of there and everyone else just passes out. Because really, like, what's gas to the Joker at this point? And nerve gas at that. Because he's wired quite differently than your average person. But when this happening, Jim Gordon is also knocked out. And it's from here that we then jump over to his daughter, Barbara, who's trying to get more information on Cressida. And she's doing so with the help of spoiler, Stephanie Brown, and also Black Bat, Cassandra Kane. But with their investigation, there's little that they've been able to pull up. Because when Barbara checks in with the others, Stephanie tells her that Cressida is in a hotel room, which was booked with a card that's connected to the the same bank as the card that Cressida had given to Jim Gordon, which is Athena Bank. But the address to Athena Bank, it had only led spoiler to Hudson Financial, which is one of the biggest banks in Gotham, which for us is like a giveaway because we know who Cressida is working with, but for Barbara and the others, it just seems like an intentional misdirect. But then on top of this, with Cassandra following Cressida around, she sees that Cressida has gone to the most expensive hotel in Gotham directly after meeting Jim at the airport. And since she's been there, she's just been lounging and swimming and getting deep tissue massages. And even with Cassandra checking Cressida's room, like they came up with nothing. And the only exception to this that they found was when Barbara saw Cressida sign the check for dinner to where her signature read Cressida C, which had then gave Barbara the idea for Cressida's surname. But after all this legwork, that was all they had, which then more or less led to the point of Barbara just calling it a day. But even with seeing the way that Cressida moved after meeting her father, it gave Barbara the notion that Cressida knew that she was being watched and while Cressida was at the hotel that she was just there waiting for something which at this point that something is likely right behind Barbara but at this point when we jump back to the Joker who has taken a heated wire to Buddy's face and sewn his mouth shut and doing this just before only taking that same wire and wrapping it around his head like come on but while doing this at this point the Joker has taken both Buddy and Jim to a different location so then on one hand he can have some quiet time to talk to Jim but then also as the Joker would describe teach Buddy a lesson for thinking he was as scary as his Uncle Billy so the Joker just made him more terrifying because if he wasn't scary then he is now but while doing this the Joker he's speaking to Gordon because he knows that Gordon's not actually still asleep which he mentions that he can tell by Gordon's breathing pattern but with the Joker creating this space to bring Gordon out here and talk to him and he tells Gordon that he knows that Gordon hates him and like after everything the Joker had done to Gordon he can understand why but he also understands that Gordon is a logical person and Gordon sees the world as an adult and with that being the case why would an adult a logical adult allow someone like Batman for so many years to just punch people people from the shadows as if it was helping the crime system work in some type of way and the Joker tells Gordon like that's the thinking of a child and with Gordon not only allowing it to happen but working with Batman he was enabling him he was grounding him and with saying this the Joker really calls Gordon out because he tells him that he was only using Batman to reach the people that Gordon couldn't because the Joker knows deep down inside like Gordon doesn't believe that Batman could ever finish the job and not even so much in the sense of killing, but instead coming to a solution of any sort that would just be a happy ending. And when the Joker asked Gordon if he believed that Batman could quote finish the job, Gordon admitted that it wasn't something that could be won, like there wasn't a destination to it. And like with this happening, it's very much like what Gordon described before with the Joker saying what you're thinking and confronting you with these ideas that you don't necessarily even want to think about or talk about. Because from there, the next thing that the Joker says, it's very much what Gordon was thinking earlier. Because when he tells Gordon that deep down, there's a part of him that believes that there's a definitive good or evil. He then tells Gordon that fighting evil doesn't make him good. And Gordon admits that he doesn't consider himself to be a good man, but he knows how to fight evil, which was exactly the part that the Joker wanted Gordon to say out loud. And with saying that, like the Joker, he tells Gordon, well, since you're a private dick now, I got a job for you. And he tells Gordon, like, I want you to solve a case for me. I want you to find out who pulled off the attack on Arkham Asylum. And initially, Gordon's response is like, you did it. And with saying that, Gordon goes down the list of like motives that the Joker may have had and a lot of the reasoning that Gordon had came up with on his way down here and more like the Joker having reasons to kill Bane but then once again the Joker hits him with the telling him what he already knows because earlier when we seen the Joker tell Jim that he didn't do it it's here where the Joker then goes even further to tell him like if he did do it or if he were to do it he could list off more than a hundred different ways that would be more interesting than the way it actually happened which immediately reminds me of the list of creative takedowns that we'd seen from the Joker way back when he quit the Legion of Doom because Lex Luthor was working with the Batman who laughs so we know that the Joker can get so super creative when he wants to 
but it's here where the Joker tells Jim like he definitely didn't kill Bane. He had plans for Bane, plans for Batman, more plans for Gotham, and all of which he put together before the Joker War. But at some point, somebody caught wind of these plans and it scared the crap out of him. And because of that, they set up the whole Arkham attack to frame the Joker, which from what we know at this point, there's a little bit more to that. But with hearing this, Jim then asks like, why would the Joker want to hire him to do this? Like, why doesn't he just kill him? And the Joker lets him know like when Jim takes this case and he figures all this out, it's going to destroy that ideal that lives deep within him about good and evil. And when that's destroyed, it's going to break Jim. And it's going to be way worse than his experience at the amusement park. And after saying that, the Joker, he just walks off, laughing, of course. But he also leaves because he knows at any moment, Vicky Sampson might show up or she bang. And because of that, he wants to make sure that he's not there when they arrive. But when he leaves, he still leaves Gordon tied up. And Gordon tries to break his way out of the chair, but doesn't quite work out. But then when Vengeance shows up, catching Gordon off guard, she just snaps the restraints off with her bare hands because she got paws like that. But as soon as she gets there and she frees Gordon, like he lets her know that the Joker's gone. And when Gordon tells her, there's like this quiet moment where she stands there and she just looks and then she turns back to him and she asks him if he's James Gordon from Gotham City. And you can kind of tell for a moment there he didn't want to say yes. Like, you're like, ah, you, why? <laughs> but he told her, he, he answered yes. But then Vengeance just tells him, go home, Mr. Gordon. You're already drowning in the darkness. Head back to the light while you still can. And with saying that, it just has Gordon shook because we know like this entire time, like even with Gordon considering the job from Cressida, that he's just been going down the slippery slope and he knows that he has. So like it's here where Vengeance tells him this and she just walks away. And now it's like just another confirmation of what he's already been thinking as far as good and evil and lying to himself in order to do the things that he believes to be right. But once again, at this point, he's left with the decision, like what's he going to do with it? Like what's he going to do with these thoughts being spoken to him and thrown in his face? all right so jumping back in we go into another flashback with jim gordon to where at this point he's been out of chicago and in gotham for some time and he's climbed the ranks to captain but not commissioner just yet and when we go back to this moment in time with him it's once again the very introspective take on what he's learned in gotham with also a heavy dose of the hindsight being 2020 but in this moment here while he's waiting on some officers who went into this building to where at this time the officers have just gone silent but then also backups taking a while to get there but then when shots break out captain gordon lets him know that he can't wait he needs to go in because with hearing these shots he's expecting the worst but also with him going in we then follow along with his thought process of him looking back and reanalyzing the things that he's learned over the years and it's here where he thinks back to something that a fellow officer had told him in chicago before he came to gotham because back at the time one of the officers told him there are those who end up in the right place at the right time and there's those who end up in the wrong place at the wrong time and the thing is for gordon like originally when his old partner told him this gordon didn't believe in absolutes and he really didn't pay that way of thinking much mind until he moved to gotham and it seemed to be like a city full of the wrong places and only wrong places but also what we end up seeing with gordon going in is he notices one of the cops is already shot and the other is being held at gunpoint and being told to like beg for his life and gordon goes in he takes this guy down and he tackles this guy through the window which is something that I think is pretty important to show here in this flashback because as long as Gordon has been physically capable, he's always been willing to roll his sleeves up and stick his neck out there rather than just telling these officers to do something that he wouldn't. But after this, while Gordon's getting patched up and the shooter's been taken into custody and it's here where Gordon's then approached by your younger district attorney, Harvey Dent, who I'm sure most of you guys know that later he'd become Two-Face, but during his time as district attorney, we would often see him and Commissioner Gordon rather than Captain in this instance, but the two of them would get along and work together well and so when harvey comes here and he tells gordon about how his stunt had shaken up the shooter but with this happening in the shooter kind of having a moment of feeling mortal and it gave harvey the opportunity to get in that guy's good graces by taking the electric chair off the table and because of that the guy spills some information about falcone having a huge deal coming up and with them saying this like of course given their source this could all very well be a setup but at the same time it's way too huge of an opportunity for them to pass up and because of that gordon agrees to get some of his guys together the next day so they can check it out and even though it's his day off gordon still agrees to do it with him saying crime doesn't sleep but his kids do which has always been a thing about gordon putting the badge before his family but then it's here where harvey gives gordon an update about the joker because he knows that prior dealings with the joker have gotten to gordon before and it's for that reason why harvey wants to keep gordon in the loop but when harvey tells him that the joker is not going to trial but instead he's getting sent to arkham 
and it's right away there where Gordon's just like, no, like this guy's gotta be thrown under the jail. Cause you send him to Arkham, he's just gonna dance right out the front door. And with Gordon saying this, like he sees that everyone else just sees the Joker as a typical criminal. But for Gordon, he recognizes that something is just not right with this guy. Cause he's way smarter and way more intentional than most would see at a first glance. And so it's after this when we then go over to the next day, which again is Captain Gordon's day off. And earlier in that day, Gordon and his wife are in marriage counseling. But the whole time that he's here, he's checking the time. He's kind of like, hey, this is taking a little long, you know? And it isn't long before Gordon asks to use their therapist's phone so that he can make a call pertaining to work. And on the surface, one of the things we're seeing again is, is definitely Gordon putting the badge before his family. But then we see this go so much deeper when he uses the phone to make a call for a squad car to pick him up. And I mean, that way his wife still has a car, so it's not like she's stranded. But this then goes so much deeper when we see after he leaves, he then makes his way to Arkham Asylum. And the reason why this is such a big deal is because on this off day, Gordon was supposed to be getting the different officers together and checking out Falcone. But instead of us seeing him go there, we then see him head over to Arkham because he just can't shake the idea of the Joker being way more than a threat than the judge or the DA believed that he is. But when Gordon gets to Arkham Asylum and he's given this tour by this guy named Frank, who then corrects Gordon and tells him it's Mr. Frank, which is almost like an ongoing joke for a little while. But with Mr. Frank giving Gordon this tour, he then takes Gordon to the secure wing of Arkham to where in this secure wing there's only one inmate and that inmate is Billy Sampson. And with showing this to Gordon, Mr. Frank, he starts to tell Gordon like Billy Sampson's backstory, which is something we'll get into in just a little bit. Because here, before Mr. Frank can really get into it, he's then stopped by Jeremiah Arkham, who at this point is the director and chief psychiatrist at Arkham Asylum. And just to give a bit of context about Jeremiah Arkham, because he had inherited the asylum which was established by his great uncle Amadeus Arkham. Where in the case of Amadeus, he was inspired to start the asylum after talking his mentally ill mother into committing suicide. And so for Jeremiah, like years later when he was like 16, and it was at that point when he, air quotes, found his purpose, when at the time he had walked into a liquor store and he encountered this mentally ill dude who had escaped from the family asylum, got his hands on a shotgun and just killed everybody in that liquor store. And for Jeremiah, staring down the barrel of that shotgun, for him, there was this moment where he was completely terrified, but then seconds later, something clicked in Jeremiah's mind to where he had then just saw straight through this guy holding the gun, and I mean like all the way down to the source of this guy's illness. And with seeing this, Jeremiah just told the guy like, look, you don't have to kill me, your father's already dead. And with Jeremiah saying that, the dude was like, you know what, you're right. And he just took his own life. And it was right then when Jeremiah knew that he was supposed to follow in his great uncle's footsteps. But when Jeremiah took over the asylum, he burned the journals of Amadeus Arkham because one, he believed that's what drove his great uncle insane. But then also because he believed more in treating the residents by their actions rather than just going off of their thoughts because actions can be observed and measured rather than trying to record the thoughts of these patients who will often say anything. And Jeremiah figured if you try to make sense out crazy is just gonna drive you crazy but with this method of observing actions this is why arkham originally started to have glass cages but in this telling here it's more so the case of billy's family paying top dollar so that he would get the best treatment possible and this is why billy has the high price jeremiah arkham treatment but also with this being the more secure containment within arkham asylum gordon requests that jeremiah takes billy out and puts the joker in and when jeremiah tells gordon that he can't do that gordon more or less hits him with the oh, oh i thought you was the boss and jeremiah Jeremiah lets him know like he, he is the boss, but making that kind of change is a call that Billy's family would have to make because they put up a ridiculous amount of money to have this done. And when Gordon tells him like, okay, we'll just give them a call and ask him. So Jeremiah lets him know that he could, but he won't. And more or less Gordon says, that's fine. He'll make the call and he'll ask himself. But as it turns out, when Gordon makes this call and he speaks to Billy's brother, and with doing so, Gordon explains about how the Joker is very dangerous and much more dangerous than Billy at this moment, who's heavily medicated. But with Gordon making his point and telling them over the phone what the Joker did with poisoning Gotham's water supply, and it's here where Billy's brother Sawyer, he responds like, hmm, that's fascinating. But Sawyer, he doesn't budge, and not only because Billy's his brother, but also because with what Billy did years ago, this is the reason why the Samson family had became rich. And so to put a bit more context to this, we later get a flashback that goes back 50 years from today that gives us more of a backstory about Billy and the Samson family wealth. Because when we take a look back into what was like a, a very Texas chainsaw-like situation, but in this case to where the Samson family had kidnapped a young girl and a bunch of her friends in order to cook them up and have them for dinner, but the last girl who was left alive, she ended up escaping from Billy and running away. And back at this time when this happened, Sawyer had taken his dad's rifle and he went out with Billy to 
chase after her and make sure she doesn't bring the police back. But as it turned out with them going after her, they never caught her. But with Billy allowing her to get away, this had then led Sawyer Sampson to finding oil on what was still their family's property. And this is pretty much how the Sampsons had accumulated their wealth. But of course, the girl who was the sole survivor, she told her story. But when it was all said and done, only Billy was arrested. And sometime later, he was then transferred over to Arkham. But that fortune, it's what provided the Sampson family with the means to request for Billy all the luxury and security that they believed he deserved. But in a nutshell, Sawyer didn't budge for Gordon's request. And so after, Gordon then radioed out for units to come to Arkham for them to watch over the Joker, but that request got denied. And even with Gordon out here on the radio trying to make this request, the reception out at Arkham was pretty bad at the time. So his radio kept going in and out and he eventually got the message that the backup was denied because they didn't want to waste any manpower on just sending a bunch of officers to babysit the Joker. But then in the middle of this, Gordon's pulled away from his radio when he sees a commotion break out at Arkham, which sends him racing inside looking for the Joker, who he then finds in the cafeteria with the whole pie except for one slice which is a complete mind flip for Gordon and I wanted to say something different than flip but you get what I'm saying but this was absolutely the Joker messing with Gordon's head because he knew Gordon thought he was going to make a move and try to get out of here and the toying with Gordon's mind continues even with the little things like the Joker calling Mr. Frank Francis and when Gordon tries to correct the Joker by telling him that the guy's name is Mr. Frank and Mr. Frank responds like well yeah my first name actually is Francis <laughs> because his name is Francis Frank and it's little things like this that are like drops in the bucket of the Joker just playing Gordon into this position to make it seem like there's something wrong with him as if Gordon is the one with the issue but at this point after taking the Joker back to his cell Gordon just grabs a chair and he sits outside and while he's out here the Joker just continues talking to him and it's here where the Joker gets into telling Gordon about his dedication to crime because for the most part Gordon has an understanding about good people getting pushed to their limits and resorting to desperation and when Gordon sees that he can more or less put himself in their shoes and think of it like well what would I do but in the case of the Joker Gordon just can't find that normal person starting point to kind of build off of and for him that's the most unsettling part and the Joker knows this and he lets him know like something bad is coming but the Joker he, he tells him he's not the hurricane he's just the dark cloud on the horizon which really is just foreshadowing of where Gotham's going in the future but on top of that when he tells Gordon that with all the time spent thinking like if he could just catch people like Carmine Falcone then who's gonna be able to watch people like him people like the Joker and when he says this Gordon then rushes immediately to radio Harvey Dent and when he leaves he tells the guy who's like sweeping to stay here or watch the door don't open it for nothing but when Gordon goes outside to try to radio Harvey Dent again the signal's bad it's breaking in and out and he tries to tell Harvey that he got caught up at Arkham and give him a bit of a heads up about the Falcone bust but with Gordon just shouting a bunch of things through the radio that kind of land on deaf ears and Gordon telling him I hope it's not tonight because he's not coming and neither am I which Gordon says with him believing that the Joker is the bigger priority but then when Gordon goes back in the Joker's missing the guy who's sweeping he's missing and when the dude comes back from like the bathroom Gordon's then like dude where's the Joker and dude's just like man I don't know I had to pee and it's like just with seeing that I, I can only imagine what this dude must be thinking like 30 years later when Gotham and the rest of the world then realize how dangerous the Joker really is but with the Joker missing from his room Gordon loses it he tells the guy to call 911 but then Gordon just finds the Joker back in the kitchen getting a slice of pie and really I believe it's here with this precise move that the Joker just keeps doing over and over again with him breaking out of his room getting a slice of pie and then just going back where it's like he's telling Gordon with his actions who he is which is not like your normal average criminal because if that were the Joker he would have escaped while Gordon was here or perhaps even before but instead the Joker stays here intentionally in spite of the opportunities that he has to escape in a way to show Gordon that he's just here to play the game and all this time while Gordon thinks that the Joker is the entire pie so to speak he's really and truly just a slice of it which is why the first time when Gordon caught him in the kitchen the Joker had the whole pie except for one slice because that's what Gordon believed the Joker to be but the second time around the Joker only has one slice which is more so what he's trying to tell Gordon that he is because again the Joker told him I'm not the hurricane I'm just the dark cloud on the horizon but with him giving Gordon the sauce so to speak and only doing so through his actions for one is pretty brilliant given the backstory of Jeremiah Arkham who at this point really isn't paying the Joker much mind which then gives the Joker the room to kind of play this joke 
joke on Gordon, but with Gordon being so set in his method of figuring things out, with trying to connect himself to the logical side of every criminal, this then causes Gordon to do some nearly crazy things. But then later on in Many Cigarettes Later, Jeremiah Arkham comes back and he lets Gordon know that Sawyer Samson had changed his mind because he decided to fund a whole new wing with way more security and with doing this to Joker, he's then going to get Billy's old room. And when this happens, Gordon's then able to leave and head back to Gotham, but as he heads back and he gets a better reception and he finds out that the whole Falcone bust was an ambush. And when Gordon gets there, Harvey Dent is pissed because the go on this bus was Gordon's call. And when these officers showed up, Falcone had men waiting on them and they just walked right into a slaughter. And Harvey lets Gordon know like their blood is on his hands because Gordon wasn't where he needed to be last night. And speaking of where he needed to be, it's then later on when he gets home and he realizes that this was also the night that him and his wife were supposed to celebrate their anniversary since it was his day off and their actual anniversary is on Tuesday. And really with seeing this whole flashback, it really just shows us not just more of what we've seen with the Joker kind of playing these games with Gordon, but it's almost like we're given this new idea that's come full circle, which started with the idea of Gotham being full of people at the wrong place at the wrong time. But in the case of Gordon, it's almost like he's in all of the right places, but at the wrong time, which low key sounds like a recipe for insanity. All right, so we're jumping back into what is pretty much the Jim Gordon series, which by the way, isn't a bad thing because I truly believe that Jim Gordon could have his own HBO series and it would be fire. But at this point with him getting a lead from Barbara about the Joker making his way to Paris, Gordon then heads out there and right away he's thinking about how he had promised his first wife, Barbara's mother, about how he would one day take her to Paris which is something that never happened with him constantly putting the badge before the family. And even though later on when Barbara was born to where from there, his wife had then stopped asking about Paris, but it was still one of those cases to where like the damage was kind of done because he had kept pushing back the date. He had booked tickets at one point and then he forgot to reschedule, which in that case meant no refund. And with that money gone, he just couldn't afford to rebook that trip again. And in hindsight, he's kind of haunted with the idea of how he had messed that up. But while he's out here following the leads on the Joker, which Barbara gave him, he then runs into some guys who work for Guy Dax or Lev Osu. But with Gordon confronting them and asking them about the Arkham Asylum incident, they immediately take it as disrespect and they beat the mess out of him. But just to give a bit more context about Lev Osu and a bit of his connection to the Joker, for this I would mainly point back to Grant Morrison's Batman R.I.P. Because back then when Bruce was exposed to Professor Milo's gas, he had went nuts for a little bit, but then eventually he took on the identity of the Batman of Zurinar. To where initially that name was supposed to be like a trigger to shut down Batman, but this alternate Batman was the product of something that Bruce had put in place in order to still get things done if there was an attack on his mind. And with doing so, it was like a short term solution that was set up to where the logical portion of his mind, it would show up as Batmite and follow him around being the voice of reason and more or less ground him from just completely going off the rails. At least until he went to Arkham and his voice of reason was like, I, I can't go in there. But it was also at this time within Arkham when Le Bosu had freed the Joker and he expressed to the Joker how much he had envied him and admired him because for Le Bosu, that identity that he had created, he believed that was the true him underneath the identity of Dr. Guy Dax, the respected neurosurgeon and family man. So with expressing these things to the Joker, he was more or less just like, well, let me show you my transformation. But after doing so, the Joker had pretty much just sliced the dude's face up. But with this being the case, like from Gordon's perspective, it's understandable why he would question the men of Le Bosu, but then at the same time, it's kind of understandable how Gordon got the response that he did. But then after this dead end, he then goes back to his fancy hotel in order to kind of sort things out and figure out the next step. But even with him staying in a place so nice, for one, he's doing it because Barbara insisted, but also with Gordon coming here, he knows that he stands out. And really more so in the case of the people here with money, knowing that he's not somebody who really usually got money. And that alone just reminds him of like black tie events in Gotham where the more wealthy and the higher ups, they would smile in his face, but not really respect him at the same time. And it still bothers him. But then it's also here where Barbara checks in and she fills in Gordon on what she's found on her end, which at this point hasn't been a whole lot because for Barbara, ever since she announced her return as Oracle from Joker War, a lot of the sources where she would get information from, they had just doubled down, tripled down on security because they're like, oh, Oracle's back. Let's not get hacked. So for that reason for her now, it's a bit more difficult for her to get information. But when she shares with her father what she's found, she lets him know that she's made a ton of calls and all the information points towards something strange going on in Santa Prisca. 
because after years ago when Bane overthrew the military and sent into place a number of new generals, but since his death, things have kind of gone back to the same old way. And at this point, nobody's clearly making the claim that they've taken his place or that they're running Santa Prisca, but with the way things are being run, it kind of gives Barbara some ideas. And at this point, she's talked to Batman about getting someone out to get feet on the ground, but even still, the lack of information is disturbing with this new female Bane popping up, as well as there being no solid evidence to Santa Prisca having the ability to just up and make a brand new Bane. And it's pretty crazy because Barbara, she wants to dig deeper into this, but at this point, the information is so scarce that if anyone goes to Santa Prisca trying to investigate, like just looking for answers, there's no telling what they'll run into. But then after this, Barbara then catches up Gordon on what she's found out about the Samson family, to where in their case, she had spoiler try to dig up some old news articles about murders committed by Billy the Brute Samson, who we had talked about in the last video, who was locked in Arkham and had died in the A-Day bombing. But in the case of the Samson family, there wasn't much to find there either. And Barbara even called in a favor from a friend at the Daily Planet to look into it, but instead all they can find was that much of these articles were replaced with news relating to the Samson Oil Company just so it wouldn't seem like there was just this big huge gap in the place of where an article should be. But with Barbara noticing that this looked like something that was intentionally covered up to where no one would really want to look into it, it's pretty much here where Gordon's like, okay, well, at least I know where to start. Because in his case, he has at least someone he can call to look into it on his behalf, but he doesn't have anyone who can really go out to Santa Prisca. But in the case of Barbara, she knows someone who has a personal stake in all of this who can check out Santa Prisca. But Barbara doesn't get into who exactly that is, and we'll talk about why shortly. But also while they're having this conversation, we see that with the Samson family, they've created a mask for Buddy that was modeled after his uncle Billy to cover up what the doctors couldn't fix with the damage that was recently done by the Joker. But after this, Gordon tells Barbara that he was informed by the Joker that all these people are being manipulated by someone else in order to get the Joker killed or captured. But then when Gordon asks Barbara what she's found on Cressida, and Barbara lets him know like Cressida hasn't been moving much. She's just been going for massages, going for swims, hanging out in the penthouse. But she shoots by him the idea of having Gordon call her if he's done in Paris and arranging his private flight out so that Barbara can see Cressida's next move. But then it's here when Barbara brings up a drawing that she used to put on the fridge when she was a little girl. And she tells him like, dad, you remember that drawing of the, I put on the fridge with the two eyes? And I just want you to know that like those two eyes, I'm looking out for you. But really with Barbara saying this, it was a callback to when she was a little girl and the two of them would just love watching spy movies together. And her favorite part of the movies was like all the secret messages. And with her saying this, Gordon knew that that message in particular, it was Barbara saying that she knew that she was being watched, which is why she was minimal with some of the details, but also with giving Gordon that message, she just let him know, like someone is figuratively looking over her shoulder. But as we know, prior to this, it looked quite literal. But after this, we then follow Gordon to a payphone as he calls Harvey Bullock to get him to do a bit of private investigating on the Samson family. And Gordon lets him know that he has Barbara helping him out, so he's gonna have her send Harvey an email with more of the details. And he also lets Harvey Bullock know that he's run into some deep pockets lately, but he doesn't really get the chance to go into the details of how, and I don't really think he was about to anyway. But this conversation is cut short when Gordon is surrounded by officers and it's here where we find that he's been taken in by Interpol. Because at this point, they have Gordon's fingerprints on a knife that was found at a murder scene to where a number of scientists were killed in Montmartre. And right away with hearing this, Gordon here is like, okay, this had to be the Joker. And as they take him into custody, the chief detective here, Isabella Howells, she lets him know like, yeah, she figured as much too, but she still has to take him in because of his connection to the evidence. But she also has some questions that she wants to ask as well. And as he's taken in, we see the Joker just kind of looking down from the rooftop, just watching this happen. But then right after this, we then go over to Santa Prisca to where we see this young lady pitching this idea about turning Bane's old prison into a tourist attraction with like a roller coaster and big screens everywhere, which would be called the Bane Experience. And I'm not going front with hearing this, I'd like to see it <laughs> like I would go. But as it turns out, this whole pitch and everything, it's something that's been made up because this mysterious lady, she's doing a bit of investigating out here on her own because for her, she had made her way into Santa Prisca in order to dig up what information she could find. And with taking this method, she's trying to talk to people and get the idea of who the investors are so that that way she can follow the money and discover who's actually running things here in Santa Prisca. But then when Barbara hacks her phone in order to get a call through with not only doing it to get a call through, but also switching the phone from silent and turning the ringer on, this completely blows this girl's cover because one, they made sure she didn't have a phone on her. Well, at least they thought they did. And as soon as her phone goes off, they just get to shoot because right away they know something's up and they don't know if she has a gun or anything else on her. But with Barbara reaching out to this woman, she was actually calling so that she can look into Santa Prisca. But with Barbara not being able to pinpoint her location, she had no idea that the girl was already there. But then it's also here in this moment to where this mystery girl gets backed into a corner and she pops a firearm out from her sleeve 
And it's here where we get the reveal that this is Alfred Pennyworth's daughter, Julia Pennyworth. And the moment's very much a, like a James Bond type of reveal, because since her father's death, she's taken things into her own hands as far as investigating and getting answers while also avoiding Batman in the process. But once again, once they reveal who she is, it's very much like a James Bond type of moment. And with saying that, like I just want to say shout out to everybody who ever played Goldeneye on Nintendo 64. And just thinking about it now, like if they ever bring that to Nintendo Switch, I'm going to have to go and get a Switch. Like I'm going to just go ahead and get the OLED. But then it's after this when we then jump back over to Barbara and Spoiler over at the clock tower and with Spoiler checking in, Barbara catches her up with things to where at this point the update is pretty much that her dad got arrested and with hearing that Spoiler or Stephanie, she's just kind of like, well, why don't we just take a trip to Paris, break him out and then just kind of hang out in Paris. <laughs> but Barbara's kind of just like, um, no. But Barbara more or less has the idea that her dad's not being charged with anything. So she kind of looks at it like one of those things that they should more or less just kind of let blow over. But as far as the situation with Barbara having Cassandra Kane watch over Cressida, not much has happened with Cressida for days. So Barbara just told Cassandra that she could leave and she'll let her know if there's anything else that pops up. But while Steph and Barbara are here talking, they notice on the cameras that Cressida, she's gotten dressed up and she's walking towards the camera while looking directly into it. And right away, Steph is like, okay, something's wrong and it's right here where the talon pops up who we've seen hiding in the corner for like the past two three issues and right away barbara she tries to do a shutdown on the clock tower but it doesn't work and when she goes for her equipment she notices that it's been sabotaged too but nonetheless she goes for a batarang which this guy didn't mess with which first of all was just a huge mistake because out of everyone barbara is well known for having impeccable aim with a batarang and she catches this dude right in the neck with it but then right after that cassandra kane she then drops in and when she drops in, I know a bunch of you guys are probably just going crazy. Cause I know a number of you are hoping to see Cassandra Kane in the Robin series, but man, like when she shows up here, when she comes back to the clock tower, she lets this talent have it like from the time she gets there she just goes off on this guy because in her case like we talked about before how she's the daughter of two assassins and how she was trained from birth to be the perfect fighter and the main bodyguard for Raj al Ghul but nonetheless in her case it's just one of those things to where you got to see her in action and with Steph and Barbara watching they're just kind of like dang well okay I, I guess you don't need us and the two of them are just watching with a scrunched face like it's a sight to see perfect. but with all this happening and this talent being shaken up pretty bad to where he just makes a break for it and jumps out the window, Barbara notices that this particular Talon was in pain, which is odd because Talons aren't supposed to feel pain. And Barbara confirms this with Cassandra because she was literally trained to analyze her opponents on a ridiculous level. And Cassandra more or less confirms like, yeah, he gonna cry in the car. And I'm paraphrasing. But with this happening and Barbara getting back to the computer and noticing that Cressida is gone, it's then here where they put together that the Talon was just a distraction. But even still with this happening and Cressida getting away, they now know about Cressida's ties to the Court of Owls. Alright, so for this one, we're going to pick up from where Gordon was taken in by Interpol with him finding his fingerprints at a murder scene in the secret lab, which on the surface, it's something that sounds just completely left field. But given the circumstance, it also sounds like the Joker just throwing Jim Gordon for a loop. But with Gordon being taken by Interpol and placed into this interrogation room, which for him, he compares to like a theater play, which he's played his part in a number of times over. And even though Chief Detective Elizabeth Howes has already told him that she didn't suspect that Gordon had murdered these scientists, she still plays the role here. Because when he starts off letting her know, like, okay, I know you've been waiting behind that glass for an hour just watching and reading his mannerisms to see if he's nervous or whatever, but he already knows that she's looked into his past at this point and she knows for sure that he didn't do this. And when she starts playing, the role like oh i don't and gordon just lets her know like no you don't because if you did and all this evidence on the table was just solid he would have been locked up in paris and it would have been a closed case no need for questioning but even with this happening like between these two there's a bit of like flirtation going on so when Gordon calls her out, Detective Hollows, she kind of cuts out the act. And from there, they get into the real reason of why she wanted to talk to Jim in the first place. Because at this point, she's been very sparing with the details with Jim. But now that they've gotten all the small talk out the way, Gordon wants to know about the lab and he wants to know exactly what his fingerprints were on. And it's here where she lets him know that his fingerprints were found on a knife that just eviscerated three scientists. But even with that being the case, this attack matched a number of Joker attacks from Gotham. But after Detective Hollows tells Gordon about the knife, 
She then veers away from the topic and right away Gordon knows that there's something about this lad that she's just not telling him. And when he asks her, she then sidesteps it again by questioning Gordon about what he knows about the group called The Network. Which like we talked about before, this was the group that had offered like vacation homes to a number of criminals and or supervillains who wanted to get out the country and find somewhere to lay low for a while. And Detective Hollows asks Gordon if he found one of these places in Belize and he tells her no because the house he had found the Joker at, like we'd seen before, it wasn't one of the vacation homes which belong to the network. But for Gordon, after telling her this, he then goes back to the lab, because up to this point, she's been sidestepping and just dancing around the topic. But this time when he asked her, she's straightforward with it. And part of the reasoning is because her questions prior were kind of leading into it. But it's here where she tells Gordon that this lab, they were cloning human tissue, which is illegal which I think goes without saying. But Detective Howells, she believes that this lab was tied to the network as like a part of their service because she thinks that they're offering like a service to where like if someone wants to fake their death, the network, they can clone the body and make it convincing. But Jim shuts that down. He's like, no, there's way easier ways to fake a death. Like nobody's going through all that trouble. And he lets her know here, rather than getting into the network or who's connected to this lab, as far as the reason it was established, but the more important thing that they need to focus on now is why the Joker wants this lab. Why does the Joker want want to clone human tissue and when Gordon says that Detective Howell she just shuts down the interrogation and she tells Gordon like let's have a drink so that from here they can then hash this out in a more conversational type of tone and it gets pretty interesting as they flip to this conversation for a while because for Detective Howells who addresses Gordon right off the bat as Mr. Gordon to where immediately he's then like no no call me Jim because once again there's a bit of this flirtation thing going on but then right away she gets into the idea of how she doesn't necessarily love the fact that Gordon didn't tell the authorities that the Joker was in France or even the mysterious way that he made his way to France without going through customs but even with saying that she lets him know that she's read quite a few books on Gotham and she's read up about him as well and she gets into the perspective on Gotham from an international standpoint and not really just France with the whole idea of Gordon using a bat signal being controversial as well as him being commissioner at the time and sanctioning a vigilante which for Gordon of course this isn't the way that he would express it but nonetheless it's the truth and in a way it almost feels like it's leaning towards the conversation he had with the Joker not long ago when the Joker told Gordon about himself and how he was enabling Batman and using Batman and it's here where Gordon goes on the defensive saying that Gotham is a unique city and it's for that reason he used what he could in order to get things done and he defends his argument on saying Gotham is unique because he also points out from the time that he's come to France he hasn't seen any teenage bird ninjas fighting clowns but when he says that Detective Howells she then makes a very valid point because in Gotham City just because people throw on costumes and they dress up their traumas to make things look more rare or unique but underneath it all they're not too different from the rest of the world because there are gangsters and killers around around the globe to whom more often than not they're just not as flashy and she gives them the benefit of the doubt letting them know like yeah okay so there are a number of heroes around the world and villains who do dress up but in the United States there's just way more and that's something that's noticed from a global perspective because for Detective Hollows her division specifically deals with American heroes and villains who operate overseas which is why for her other colleagues in other divisions they'll refer to her as Madam Halloween because internationally superhero or supervillain investigations are more novel but even with her colleagues kind of teasing her with the Madam Halloween thing she admits that she's been tempted to buy like all black and orange Hermes in like a ton of outfits and just have that be her costume <laughs> and she playing but Steve Harvey would do it <laughs> like but no really I believe he would but then it's here where Gordon asks her like what do you want from me and when she tells him like I'd rather hear from you like what do you think I want and it's here where Gordon puts it together like he knows that her job right now it's it's a novelty type of thing because American superheroes and supervillains they rarely cross overseas and get into anything substantial and if Gordon was to help her out by catching the Joker and throughout that process give her more information on the network and the players behind it then this would give her a huge advantage in front of her higher ups because then she would be able to track criminal activity on a global scale and when he tells her like in response she's like yeah you are right but with saying this the deal that she's proposing is that if Gordon gives her something actionable on the network she'll give him all the resources he needs in order to apprehend the Joker and take him back to Gotham but then for Gordon he's kind of like well well, what if I didn't want to exactly apprehend the Joker, you know what I'm saying? 
But when he says that, like, she doesn't mind if the Joker's caught dead or alive. But the one thing that she does ask is that nobody knows that they're working together. But as soon as she says that, Gordon's then like, that might be a problem. And the reason why is because Vengeance is standing right over her shoulder. And she doesn't like this plan or negotiation whatsoever. And with Vengeance just creeping up on Detective Hollow, she gets the strap. And rather quickly, too, like, it's a knee-jerk reaction. But that does her no good when Vengeance just crushes her hand. And mind you, this whole time, Vengeance just has the calmest expression ever. Like, this is nothing but then when gordon goes to stop vengeance which you know like that that's not gonna happen but then it's here where vengeance just tears off detective hollow's arm just rips it right off and like the look on gordon's face is like how how is this life right now like he can't believe this is happening but it's here where vengeance tells him like i told you to go home mr gordon but at this point that's no longer an option and you're coming with me and from there she just puts gordon in a chokehold he passes out and she tosses him in the backseat of a car and when gordon wakes up he's more or less just like oh hell nah this, this seemed like a job for batman where my red phone at but even with him thinking this he stops for a minute and he thinks again like okay well wait why am i in this car because if she wanted me dead she could have easily made that happen earlier but from here forward it's just all bad for the authorities she rips off the car door and she takes it live and direct into one dude's neck she then takes down another officer snatches his gun to then take out another two behind the next car and to top it all off she then takes down the chopper with the same car door she just ripped off but then just after this for vengeance like right after she just handles the authorities she picks up gordon tosses him over her shoulder takes him to a boat and after that they're out of there but then of course for gordon it's here where he just has a ton of questions of course and like for starters he wants to know if isabella or detective hollows like if she's still alive and ben just lets him know like interpol they came they intercepted her and if their medics are competent then she'll live and it's just like man cold world but gordon is just going off because the way that vengeance had came in it was definitely extreme and he lets her know like there's no need for that because he doesn't even think that interpol knew who she was and while they're on the topic gordon then asks who she is because he's seen her before but it's here where she tells him her name is vengeance but then when he asks her like who does she work for like whose vengeance are you and she responds by telling him that's what she's trying to decide and it's pretty much from here where we go into story time because it's here where Vengeance lets Gordon know that her and some of her men, they went to the laboratory in Paris on a mission where she believed that she was in charge of. Because her orders from the higher ups was to head to this lab, catch the Joker. But as soon as she got there, her men, they just started burning down the lab, which right away let her know that somebody was trying to hide something. But also while her men were burning down this lab, the fire then revealed that there was a lower portion that the authorities hadn't gotten to yet. And when she went down to check it out, this is where she found like the real secrets. Because it was down here with a significant work for the lab was being done because it was down here where she found dna samples for pretty much every notable villain and hero with the exception of batman because his was just missing but then on top of that she then found a folder that had a sticky note on it left by the joker much like he had wanted her to see this or he wanted her to find it and on top of the folder it read bane mark ii vengeance and it was inside this folder to where vengeance discovered how she was made and why because in this file, it starts with the original Bane, and it talks about how his project had went too well, as far as the experiments that gave him Venom, which gave him super strength, but it also goes on to say that Bane's hatred for Batman, which he had internalized so deeply, he didn't notice that it was planted there. But overall, they considered Bane to be far from a failure because of the symbol he established himself to be, the strength he represented for their island, and the way that he caused other nations to fear them. But even with him coming along with all these benefits, he was impossible to control. And that's why the leaders of Santa Prisca made a deal with this laboratory in order for them to build a new Bane. But this time, with the use of more advanced conditioning, they wanted to build a Bane that they could control. One that would be addicted to Venom from birth, who wouldn't question any orders. And Vengeance tells Gordon, like when she discovered all this, to only then find her quote-unquote team burning down the lab because the higher-ups just wanted to bury this secret forever. And from there, she just killed everyone on that team and more or less had just went her own way since. And really with this happening, like the leaders of Santa Prisca, they set themselves up because you just don't go and create another Bane without thinking that that leadership and that hunger for liberty and those core attributes are just not going to be there. Because now they pretty much just created another Bane who from here forward is just going to do what she feels like needs to be done in the way that she feels like it needs to be done. But with hearing this origin story, Gordon's then like, okay, well, you, you finna kill me now? But she tells him no, which I feel like is pretty clear because, you know, once again, she would have been done it if that was really what she wanted to do. So then, of course, Gordon then asks, like, what does she want with him? And in response, she tells him your passion. 
And I ain't gonna front for a minute there. I was like, wait a minute, where's this going? And Gordon kind of looks like he was thinking the same. But Vengeance lets Gordon know that he's old, he's lived a long time, he's tried to do the right thing. And like her, he's on a hunt for the Joker. And it's from here. When she tells Gordon what she would do to the Joker if he were here, like this part gets pretty extreme. Because she lets Gordon know like her hate for the Joker, it's been programmed into her. So if he were there or in the moment to where she gets her opportunity, she wouldn't be able to control it. Like that hatred or that programming, it would just take over. And she's played this scenario out in her mind a number of times over because all of the times that she was put into an artificial sleep, like this is what she would dream of. And it's pretty detailed because it starts with ripping the Joker's tongue out with a heated iron, removing his fingernails and rubbing salt in the wounds, break his bones one by one, and doing this ever so carefully so he doesn't just slip into shock too quick. But then when he does finally die, she would then bury him in a place far away from Gotham, like a place in the world that meant absolutely nothing to the Joker. But then after burying him, she would then wait there for a week just to make sure he was dead and nobody came back and got him. Then she would just dig him back up and burn his body so that the wind can then just carry his ashes until nothing was left. And when hearing this, it just kind of has me like, man, like who wrote the code for her hatred? Like there's a dude somewhere in Santa Prisca who's just like, oh yeah, 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 put that in there too. He like, no, 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 no. She gonna bury him, right? And she gonna stay there and she gonna dig him back up, man. <laughs> like whoever that dude was, he really had time that day. But then again, this whole thing is designed with Santa Prisca getting the revenge on the Joker for killing Bane, cause that's what they believe at this point. And it's really the reason why that extreme hatred was just imposed on her. But with Vengeance discovering the truth that she had learned in the lab, she no longer wants to execute her purpose for her generals. But because her hate for the Joker is just wired into her, she'll never be free until the Joker's dead. And she pretty much lets Gordon know like whatever the reasoning is for why Gordon wants to kill the Joker, she would rather stand behind him and kill the Joker for Gordon instead. And she fervently asks him like, Jim Gordon, let me be your vengeance. And when she says that, like, it's pretty crazy the way that this thing is flipped around. But even with her making this offer, I really like how Vengeance notices in the case of Gordon, like, why does this good man come across the world in order to stalk the Joker and kill him? But she also lets him know, like, the last time they had met in Belize, she saw how Gordon hesitated. And she knows that though Gordon wants to, like, given the opportunity, he's just not going to go through with it. But in the case of Vengeance, she's one, wired to do this. But then secondly, this is her only opportunity to truly be free and determine her own path in life and with hearing all this gordon he's pretty much like well it's not a bad deal but I, he, he just doesn't know where the joker is but vengeance tells him that's not a problem because she does because the chief scientist of that lab, he has another lab on his private estate in Mallorca, Spain. And because Vengeance didn't see the chief scientist amongst the dead scientists, she's come to the conclusion that the Joker has taken him there in order to accomplish what he's looking to truly achieve. And who knows what that might be? It may have something to do with the missing Batman DNA. Like, who knows? Or it could be two more Jokers, <laughs> so we can get three Jokers again. <laughs> Alright, so picking back up with your Gordon Vengeance team up with Vengeance recently discovering how and why she was created just to kill the Joker, which was a revelation that caused her to want to seek her own freedom. Because since this bloodlust for killing the Joker is just wired into her DNA, she has to do it to be free. But instead of doing it for the scientists and the leaders of Santa Prisca, she had instead sought out Gordon because with her desire to kill the Joker being wired into her DNA, it really just set the stage for the two of them to have this mutual benefit if they come together because Gordon wants the Joker dead but he can't do it and Vengeance needs the Joker dead or she'll just have this perpetual desire to kill him. So she came to Gordon like let me be your Vengeance, she'll kill the Joker for him and everybody's gonna be happy. But with them coming to this agreement of sorts, this is what takes the two of them over to Mallorca, Spain because this is where Vengeance believes that the Joker had taken the surviving lead scientist who just happens to have an extra lab over here on his estate. But also with the two of them making their way there, Gordon he starts to make conversation and with doing this he tells vengeance a bit more of his backstory but even with him attempting to tell vengeance his story he quickly begins to realize that for the most part it's a joker story because when he brings up barbara it gets into the killing joke and of course when you get into the conversation of where gordon was he was at the amusement park getting driven out of his mind and even though gordon would build back up over the years the joker would then just tear him down again like with the death of his second wife sarah essen the death of his son james gordon jr and all the events that have taken place in between 
and of course with hearing this it's enough to get vengeance amped as if she wasn't already. But also with Gordon with him coming here in this whole arrangement with vengeance it's really got him in a place to where he's having second thoughts. But the whole time while he's thinking whether to call Barbara or get Batman and how much sense it would make to stop all of this right here and now but even anytime that it crosses his mind he still doesn't do it and it's almost like he's noticing himself allowing this to happen. But when they arrive here we then jump over to Barbara who's at the clock tower looking to see if she can find any clues from the Talon who had recently attacked her had left behind. But also while she's doing this she's talking to Julia Pennyworth who's down in Santa Prisca getting as much information as she can before more security shows up. But they're collecting all this information on the Venom Serum, its developments and the history of the program, she finds a ton of information but when she does it's all hard copy which makes sense because if it was digital this would have been got leaked. But while she's down here she's able to go through a lot of this and take pictures because it's likely once they find out that their archives have been compromised they'll just end up destroying everything that was there. But then it's also here where we see Julia go through a bit of the history of the Venom Serum which was originally derived from the Miraculous Vitamin better known as Miraclo from Rex Tyler which at one point was then taken by General Timothy Slaycroft who had brought it down to Santa Prisca to where from there the higher ups in Santa Prisca made deals internationally but it's also here where Julia finds out that the secret leaders who are running Santa Prisca now that they're the same generals who had built Peña Duro who had also created Bane and as Julia continues to go through these archives she also finds that one of Santa Prisca American contacts sold a missile to a supervillain and with hearing that right away Barbara just knows that that's referring to the Joker as far as what led to the events of death in the family. But on top of that it also immediately makes Barbara nervous but they're just now discovering that there's much deeper ties almost as if there's been a larger story playing out this whole time that they were unaware about which just hits closer to home every time. And so with going back over to Gordon and Vengeance as they make their way into this house like it's pretty clear that somebody's been there with there being like a trail of bodies just heading inside and with Jim walking into this like he admits that he's a bit rusty from his days as commissioner because from his experience like when you walk into situations like this you gotta constantly be on edge because you don't know if the shooter is just hiding somewhere ready to pop out but ironically enough as they make their way inside they find the joker just sitting there along with the chief scientist just having a cup of tea but when Gordon and Vengeance make their way in right away Vengeance she sees the joker and she just sees red because with him just sitting there all she sees is space and opportunity i but with the chief scientist just saying orchard hammered obsidian just like that vengeance is shut down which as we find out was just a command that was embedded in her but it's only effective for like five minutes and it's a one-off but with vengeance down the lead scientist he lets gordon know that the joker's wired his house with explosives but now that gordon has brought vengeance here the scientist more or less has a bomb of his own with the clock ticking for her to wake up and go after the joker but he more or less just tells gordon to stay out of this and just walk away and pretty much just leave the same way that he came because what him and the Joker are discussing here is highly confidential and he'd rather this information not get back to Gordon's friends in Gotham or his new friend over at Interpol. But Gordon puts it together pretty quickly that this guy's a part of the network and when this happens the Joker tells the lead scientist that Gordon's figured out much of this already and there's really no need to keep any secrets here. And with the clock ticking the doctor he pretty much just opens up and he lets Gordon know his name is Dr. Friedrich Baum. He confirms that he's a member of the network and he invites Gordon and the Joker down to his laboratory to show them more of what he's been working on. And like the crazy thing is as Dr. Baum takes them down into his laboratory and he explains some of the services that the network provides with his cloning which include fancy ways to fake someone's death and right away it's like man Detective Howells from Interpol she was pretty spot on with her guess. And when Dr. Baum gives the example of like say someone was locked up in prison for life all he would need was like a DNA sample some blood work and some biometric scans and they could create a duplicate of them and give that clone either a heart attack or an aneurysm you name it. And in the case of a clean cut death it would simply just be case closed. But I can't help but think with getting this information that there were a couple clients from A-Day who more or less used this and got away. Who may be still walking around now and looking like nemesis. And you guys know who I'm talking about. And also with Dr. Baum describing the process to where at some point the duplicates would need to be planted and to do so they would just pay off a security guard or whoever to quietly get it done but then later on they would kill that guard just to make sure they stayed quiet. But aside from this they would also produce a number of brain dead bodies which were exclusively sold to high-end clients for meal consumption. 
And amongst those clients, of course, you got like the Samsung family. But aside from them, the network has accumulated other clients who purchased this product from around the world, some of which with high end restaurants, which include secret menus. But with hearing all this, Gordon stops the whole thing and he's more or less like, dude, like, why are you telling me all this? And it's here where Dr. Baum lets Gordon know that he'll never see consequences for these actions because he has powerful connections in high places who would just let him go if he was taken in. But also, he expresses that if he were to get into the wrong hands, he would be dead in a matter of hours. And with the way that he emphasizes himself, it really imposes the idea of him also using the copy system just to make sure that too much information doesn't get out and into the wrong hands. And it also begs the question of is this actually him? But then it's from here with the Joker, he pretty much cuts the small talk and he lets Gordon know that Mr. Baum is talking around the real reason why they're here. And it's from here where Dr. Baum takes them into the next room, which is just filled with botched attempts at trying to clone the Joker, all of which who are alive more or less. But with showing them this, Dr. Baum, he explains the complication and he lets Gordon know that the chemicals which stain the Joker's skin, they had damaged his genetic material, making the process of creating a clone of the Joker more or less a fool's errand. But with seeing this right away, Jim aims at the Joker like, why would you do this? <laughs> and more or less, the Joker's like, I don't know, start a podcast and <laughs> call it Three Jokers. <laughs> no, but really, the Joker tells Jim that he didn't want this they did. And as it turns out, Dr. Baum, he tells Gordon that somebody paid him a significant amount to get this done. And even though he knew it was practically impossible, he still made the attempt anyway, and really just for the sake of accepting the challenge. But when they hear something crashing and making its way towards them, Dr. Baum is like, oh, that's vengeance. And it's here where he tells Gordon that she's pretty much the first of many manufactured villains that the network wants to release in Gotham as a way to advertise their services with the world watching how their product holds up against Batman. And with hearing this, Gordon's squeezes but the gun's jammed which more or less figures because he got that gun from vengeance and there's really no telling how long she'd been compromised up to this point but when the crashing visitor makes their way in it's not vengeance but instead it's vicky samson who right away kills dr bomb while also giving him complaints about the meat from like the manufactured humans they've been serving up because she tells him that they lack the taste of fear of death in them but ultimately she kills dr bomb because she believes that the network is partially responsible for the death of her uncle billy but as this happens buddy samson he then creeps up on the joker vicky then drugs the joker so that the two of them can take him back to their uncle sawyer so that he can do the honors himself and slow cook the joker over a spit but then with them making the the Joker go night night they get ready to leave but then Vicky's like oh yeah the cop and she just tosses a knife into Gordon's chest which totally caught me off guard and then I know he's surprised but with Gordon bleeding out and going in and out of consciousness he can only watch as the Samsons leave but just moments after they leave, he's then awoken by Vengeance, who is pissed because the Joker is gone. But Gordon tells her what he knows as far as the Joker being taken to Texas. But after that, she pretty much just leaves him there, more or less telling him, I'm sorry how this panned out, but just die knowing that you will have your vengeance. And right after that, she just walks out. And I'm sorry, had I been Gordon, I'd have had some slick words. Are you just gonna leave me bleeding out? Like, I don't need vengeance right now. I need medical attention. But at this point, Jim, he then finally pulls out the phone. And he makes his call to Barbara, but as soon as she picks up, she just starts talking. And I know we all know that person who does that. But when she does start talking, she is saying something very interesting. And I mean, it's not more important than Gordon bleeding out right now, but it's close. Because for Barbara, while she was looking around searching for clues that this Talon had left behind, she had found some of his blood and she tested the sample to find the identity, which had happened to be a match for her deceased brother, James Gordon Jr. And I'm gonna tell you right now, if we get like a thorough return of James Gordon Jr. or even a genetically modified version who like still had the skill set but just wasn't a creepy psycho killer, like I think a new story for him could really go some places. But in the meantime, we got bigger problems because Gordon is bleeding out and we don't know if anybody they gonna find him. All right, so for this one, we take another trip into the flashback territory, and it's done in a very similar way to what we'd seen in issue five, which did the whole flashback of Jim Gordon and the Joker at Arkham. But for this one, this time we get into the aftermath of the killing joke, which is an event that we've revisited in this series a number of times. And I'm sure some people are like, oh, here we go again, like CJ. But in this case, possibly more than any other, or rather more importantly than any other, with us revisiting the time after that night, this now takes us into into the territory of starting the discussion of how does Gordon go back to a regular life after this. Because throughout this whole series, we've seen people question Gordon, we've seen Gordon question himself, like is he okay or is he not okay? 
And with us getting this story within this time frame, it gives us a look at Gordon's life fresh after. And so with how this starts off at Gordon's home, with his daughter Barbara there, who was recently shot by the Joker, to where in her case, it's still quite some time before she became Oracle or she received her implant that allowed her to walk again and continue as Batgirl. And at this time, you have this moment where Barbara spills some milk. And when this happens, she loses it. And it's totally understandable. She's been shot. And this moment just reminds her of the things that she can't do for herself. And even with Jim trying to help her out and clean things up and tell her that this is temporary and that he's here to help. And he's trying to encourage her and tell her that she's strong. But right now, Barbara doesn't want to hear that because she believes that the Joker broke her and that the Joker broke him too. And at this time, she believes that she's the only one between the two of them who wants to admit it. And even at this point, Gordon, he doesn't get into this conversation too much because he's running late to get to the precinct. And though this conversation more or less ends here, Jim does have another conversation with Barbara, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But through the course of this, I want you to keep in mind, and even just from this example, how we're seeing for Jim, the father, the commissioner at this time, that for him, not being okay is not an option. And I like how throughout this Joker series, we keep getting these stories that constantly jump back and show us that side of Jim, who's not really the type to just express all of these things that he's going through in detail, but that doesn't mean that he's not suffering in his silence. But when we see Jim go back to the police station to where at this point, he's supposed to be on psychiatric leave. When he comes back, you got people looking at him sideways, like, you know, is that guy okay? And even Captain Wojcik, who's acting commissioner at the time, filling in for Jim, when he sees Gordon come back, talking about Joker sightings that he'd seen in the paper and asking to get back into action. And the captain's like, whoa, Jim, aren't you supposed to be on psychiatric leave? Like, I don't know. Let me call the mayor and make sure it's OK for you to even be here. But the captain lets Jim know that the sightings he saw in the paper, they're not the real Joker. It's only some copycat that's out there. And he tells Jim that when they do find the real Joker, that they're going to take his head clean off. So for the time being, Jim should just go home and be with his daughter and let the fellas handle this, which of course Jim finds offensive because he wants to get back to work and not even so much in the case of just jumping back into the seat of commissioner, but he wants to get back to the investigation on the Joker. But instead, Captain Wojcik's like, no, go back home to your daughter. We got this. And don't forget to visit your shrink before you come back. And you can tell for Jim before he goes home, he stops by the park, sits on the bench and just stares into nothingness that at this point in time, he's found himself in a place to where he's just being questioned, regardless of which way he goes or what he does. And it doesn't stop here because after this, when he stops by the Lebanese place and picks up some food for him and Barbara, but when he gets home, he sees Barbara and James only to then find that James's mother is also there and she wants to have a talk with Gordon. And it's here where Barbara, James's biological mother, and also at this point, Jim's ex-wife, after just popping up, she asks how things are. And Jim more or less is just like his daughter. She's coming along. He's fine. And with the way that he kind of just brushes over it, she lets him know that he almost sounds convincing. But what they're coming here, she's come here to tell Jim that recently their son James has become obsessed with the Joker. And of late, James Jr. has been asking questions that she doesn't really know how to answer. And Jim's kind of like, yeah, well, that's part of being a parent. But with her bringing James Jr. here, she's telling Jim that now it's his turn because James needs to be in a stable home. And when Jim responds like, well, what about that guy Martin that you're with? Because it seems that the two of them were pretty stable back in Chicago. And it's here where Barbara tells Jim that Martin is terrified of James. And it's right then where Jim is like, okay, let James stay here for a while. And he tells her on top of that, she should stay for dinner, but she just storms out saying that she has to go. But then after she leaves, Jim and the kids, they didn't have dinner, which more or less was the Lebanese food that he had just brought home. But after they're done eating, Jim then goes to get James so James could do the dishes. But at this point with doing so, he only then finds James going through his desk and looking at all the confidential Joker files. And again, like anytime we get a flashback for James Gordon Jr., it's just red flags the whole way through. And this flashback is no exception. But with Jim finding his son looking through these files, he snatches him up and he of course asks James like, why are you going through this stuff? And James tells Jim that it's because he wanted to see. And when Jim's like, see what? And James is just like, he wanted to see if the person who hurt Jim and Barbie, if they were gonna come back for him. And really at this time, Jim just kind of chalks it up like, okay, well, James is just scared. But then just after this, he sees a shadowy figure on the fire escape. So he goes to grab his gun and his flashlight only to then find that, of course, it's Batman who at this point, you would think he'd been sneaking on the fire escape for a while. Because prior to this, Barbara, she's obviously already been Batgirl. And you could tell that once Gordon sees that it is Batman, the two of them just jump back into their rooftop dialogue. And of course, in this moment, Gordon's on edge with his son mentioning the idea of the Joker coming back for them. And it makes it obvious why Jim is jumpy when he comes outside to see who it is. But at this point with Batman, who in one of these images, he has like the Robert Pattinson head shape treatment. But when Jim sees Batman, right away, he's asking Batman about the Joker. But in 
response, Batman tells Jim that no one has seen the Joker recently. And he's not here for that, he's here to check on Jim. And when Jim tells Batman that maybe he should focus on the freaks taking over this city, Batman then tries to slow it down by telling Jim the trauma that he's going through, like that this could be a difficult thing. And right then Gordon's more or less like, I know you ain't talking to me about mental health. And when we get that moment and Jim says that, I kind of wanted him to go in a little bit more and just go off like, you know, I only allow you to be the Batman because I needed the help. But then instead, when Batman asks about his daughter Barbara, Gordon just goes off, telling Batman to never speak her name and how she's never been a part of Batman's world and she never will be. And for Batman, we kind of just get the dot dot dot, like he wanted to tell Jim something here. But when Jim just turns around and goes back inside, he tells Batman to get off of his fire escape because at this point, it's unclear whether Gordon knew or he didn't know that Barbara was Batgirl because after this point in Gordon's life, we've seen it come to him as a surprise. But then earlier in this series, we've seen Gordon mention that he's known for a while. But with Jim going off on Batman in this moment, it's not done from the perspective of Jim having known already, not at this point, but instead he's trying to make it clear to Batman that he wants to keep his daughter separate from the world of Batman and the whole idea of Jim even working with Batman, which again is him trying to protect his daughter. But then when he goes back inside and he puts his gun and his flashlight back in the drawer, Barbara sees this and she tells him that she doesn't like seeing the gun in the house and Jim lets her know that he's only keeping it so that he can protect them. But then in response, Barbara then says, and how's that going? And it's like, man, like way to kick a dude when he's down, you know, figuratively, of course. But then the next day, Barbara, she makes breakfast to make it up to Jim because she knows what she said the day before that that was a heavy one. But with her making breakfast for the three of them, Jim then goes to get James and bring him to the table. But when he goes to look for James Jr., James isn't in his room, Jim's gun is missing and the window's left open. And it's from here where Jim makes his way to the police station and talks to Harvey. And right away, Jim is telling them that the Joker took his son. But Bullock just lets him know that it's more likely that the kid had just ran away. And it's one of those common cases to where when the kid sees how bad it is and they strike out of luck, they eventually then just come back home. And aside from that, he does let Gordon know that him and the boys will keep an eye out for James. But one way or another, James will show up. And there's even a point here where Harvey Bullock, he stops Jim from just storming inside the police station and just going on and on about the Joker because Bullock knows that that's not gonna go well for Jim. So from there, Harvey Bullock just tells Jim to go home. And when this happens, Officer Montoya, who's just an officer at this time, she hasn't become a detective yet or taken up the mantle as the new question. But soon after they leave, Jim hears a call over the radio. That sounds like another Joker description, but this time he's with a kid. And it's here with Officer Montoya, she responds to this call with Jim already with her. And it's funny how like when they first got in the car, she's talking to Jim and calling him commissioner. But at that point, Jim was like, no, just call me Jim. But then when they arrive at this skating rink, which is where this Joker and the child were said to be spotted, she tells Jim to stay in the car. But he's like, no, that's not happening. You're not going in there without backup. And he tells her, you know, commissioner's orders. And then Montoya is kind of like, well, yeah, but you're not commissioner though. And when she said that, I was just like, oh, got him. But when Jim tells her that he believes that it's his son in there, she gives him her gun and she waits outside for backup. And after this, when Jim makes his way inside, from here, he more or less just follows the laughter and this is what leads to him finding his son, who appears to be taken hostage by this guy who claims to be the Joker. And for Jim, when he gets ready to shoot this guy, you can tell in this moment that he really wanted it to be the Joker. And that at this point, he's just bought into the belief because this guy's got his son and he still wants to get the Joker back for what he did to his daughter. But before Jim can shoot this guy, Batman steps in and he tells Jim that this is not the Joker. Let me handle this. And at first, Jim's like, no, but Batman tells him to think of his son. And so from there, Batman just does his vengeance, take down and he beats the mess out of this guy who he knows is not the Joker. And this dude is just begging Batman like, no, please, no more. It's only a water gun. But this also gives Jim the opportunity to get James and get him out of there. But after this, when Jim talks to his son, James, James tells him that this guy had taken them from their home because he hates their family and he doesn't want to see them back together like they were. And you can tell now at this point that Jim, he's not really believing James' story because he asks his son, are you being honest with me? Because on the way over there, Jim also heard that there were witnesses who said that the kid was laughing and having fun with this guy. But then it's here where Batman shows up again and he calls Jim over to this dark corner to go talk to him. And Jim admits like with Batman coming out here and helping that he's not used to seeing Batman come out in the daytime. But he lets Batman know that either way, he's glad that he was here. And he even tells Jim when he heard what was going on, he made the exception. Batman made 
made the exception to come out in the daytime because he knew that Jim needed him. And he goes on to tell Jim that he believes he's a good man. But today, Jim was about to make a huge mistake. And it's also in this moment here where Batman gives Jim his gun, which he found dropped near where this copycat Joker was. And Batman wanted to make sure that he gave it to Jim before the other officers found it and matters just got worse. But then it's here where Batman lets Jim know that the copycat, he never touched this gun, let alone fired it. And aside from that, the makeup that the copycat had on, it was actual circus clown paint, unlike James Jr., whose face paint was a combination of different cosmetics that he had likely just taken from his sister Barbara. And with hearing this Jim, he's putting it together because he knows the kid's lying, and what Batman is telling him here makes more sense. But that doesn't make it any easier to listen to. But Batman tells Jim that he's only telling him all of this in hopes that he would get James some help. And just before Batman leaves, he tells Jim that he should talk to his psychiatrist too, so that Jim can get back on his feet because his family needs him and not just his family but batman tells jim that he needs him too and after that batman he just does the disappearing thing all right so for this one for the most part we come back from the flashback where we've seen batman warning gordon about his son james and we go back into the real-time events of what happened after vengeance had just left gordon bleeding out with her asking where did they take the joker and jim telling her that they took him to texas but just before we hop back into the real time, we get a quick flashback for the Samson family, which in this case is a continuation of the flashback that we got in issue 6, when we had seen both Billy and Sawyer Samson chase down the young girl who had barely gotten away with her life, which moments later led to the Samson brothers finding oil on their property. And it's here that we find that after they'd found oil, this is when they were approached by the network who had made their way to Hooper, Texas to make their offer to the Samson family, which at the time initially had Sawyer believing that this was just another group of rich guys who had made their way out to their home, offering some huge check to buy their property. But what we come to find is that when this happened, Sawyer, he didn't mind giving this guy an example of the last guy that came to their home attempting to buy it. And that example he gives by having Billy roll the other dude's head over to him. But when this happens, Sawyer quickly finds out that this mysterious guy and his associates are more or less cut from the same cloth, with them both having a similar taste in people. <laughs> But quickly we find that the network, they had approached the Samson family early on, not for the reason of buying their land, but instead to get them to join the network. And for that to happen, all Sawyer had to do was let the network clean up this mess that the Samson family had gotten themselves into, which would then provide the Samson family with access to their lawyers, their bankers, and their systems of resorts and safe houses around the world, where they can truly indulge in all the sick and twisted things that they already do without having to look over their shoulder, while also making sure that the Samson family makes the most amount of money by introducing them to the right buyers for their oil so the Samson family can build an empire. But in order to make all this work, the Samson family would have to make a sacrifice. Because with the girl that got away, they pretty much paid her to change her story. But with doing this, one of the Samson family members had to take the fall. Which like we've seen before, that turned out to be Billy Samson. And Sawyer agreed to this because the network said that Billy would be taken to Arkham Asylum, he'd be declared insane, but he would be well taken care of. And Sawyer agreed to this at the time under the belief that nothing would happen to Billy. But fast forward to now with Billy being killed during the Arkham attack by way of the modified Joker toxin and really more or less this is our reminder of why they're preparing the Joker for dinner and not as a guest. But then after this we then jump back over to Jim Gordon who we find at this point bandaged up and recovering with his recent memories coming back to mind with him remembering the Joker and what he saw in that lab along with vengeance and her promise to kill the Joker, as well as the Samson family taking the Joker back to Texas, which right away wakes him up thinking, man, I gotta get down there now. And it's here where we find that Barbara's found him, she's got him patched up, and she's brought him back to Gotham. And of course, with him telling Barbara that he needs to get to Texas because it's about to be a bloodbath down there, and not just with the Samson family getting ready to eat the Joker, but also with Vengeance heading that way. And of course, Barbara's like, there's no way she's letting her dad go back down there, and not just with his condition, but especially because of his condition. But Barbara lets Jim know that she's going to handle this herself. She's going to talk to Cressida, and she's going to have Julia Pennyworth trail her. And after everything's sorted out and it's handled, then she's going to tell Batman. And right away for Jim, he can tell that something's changed. Because the way that Barbara's moving about this, this isn't what she would normally do. But at this point, we know that Barbara's making this decision, partially because of the recent discovery that she made when she was attacked by that mysterious Talon whose DNA matched her brother. And even with this being the case, you would think 
that this was information that she had shared with Jim already at this point. But like we had seen when Jim called her and Barbara picked up just talking about what she had found. But shortly after Barbara had picked up, Jim had passed out. He missed all that because she was going to tell him everything at first. And for Barbara, because she found her father barely hanging on for life, she's just decided to cut him out of it completely including the information about James Gordon Jr. And really it's from here as Barbara gets ready to go, she tells Jim not to leave or else she'll have a teenage ninja kick open his stitches, who of course we know that's a reference to Cassandra Kane, who Barbara has watching over Jim really for the purpose of keeping him safe more than anything. But even after Barbara leaves, Jim, he's not letting it go, of course, because he knows if Barbara makes one wrong step down there, she's getting killed. So from here, Jim then puts up a board and he tries to figure out what exactly it is that the Joker has to gain from this. But every time he tries to solve for X or find that answer, it doesn't make sense and he just hears the voice of the Joker laughing at him. Because when he puts all this together, for one, the Joker told him that he didn't set all of this in motion because he had nothing to do with A-Day. And really, if he did, he wouldn't be lying about it. But then also, it's clear to Jim that somebody wanted everyone to believe that the Joker did because somebody wanted the network to send out vengeance before they were ready to and for whatever reason that same someone wanted to provoke the Sawyer family but then on top of that somebody wanted Jim to bear witness to all of this madness all of this insanity knowing that Jim had ties to the superheroes of Gotham City but the lingering question was who who would benefit from all this and for a moment Jim thinks about it but then it hits him and it's right then when he knows who it is and what he has to do and it's from here where first Jim calls Harvey Bullock who fills Jim in on everything that he pulled up on the Samson family, starting with that young girl who got away, who was the only witness who had initially testified and then changed her story like a month later, as well as the details of Billy being the only one that was arrested, to where then he did about 50 years in Arkham, only to later be killed on A-Day. And right then, Jim grabs the black card he was given by Cressida, he gets dressed, and he tells Harvey to head to the closest private airport so that he can pick him up so that the two of them can head to Texas straight to the heart of this horror show because there's something that's been staring Jim in the face and Jim thinks that he just started looking at it back in the eye. And from here, Jim then heads out knowing that whoever Barbara has watching him, that it's not likely that they're gonna kick his stitches out for real because Barbara wouldn't risk the chance of him actually bleeding out. So he heads out the door knowing that whoever is watching him, that it's most likely that Barbara told them just to follow him and keep keep Jim safe. But before Jim hits the airport, he makes a couple stops, with one of them being to a tailor who can weave body armor into clothing without making it mad bulky, and let me know in the comments when you see it. But then after this, he stops by a surveillance shop to pick up some gear, since he can't rely on the red phone anymore, and after that, he heads to the private airport and he hires a pilot. But even with Jim heading to go pick up Harvey and make their way to Texas, he's still injured, like he was stabbed in the chest. And with him going out here, he's still in pain, which has him thinking that on one hand, he feels fine enough to keep moving, but also at the same time, he's thinking that this trip could be the end of the line. But still, he doesn't care because he has to see this through, and he has to literally look the truth in the eye. And so also at this time at the Samson estate, we're shown that the Joker's made his way there, but we don't get into this portion just yet as far as the Samson family dinner plans until a couple issues later. And trust me, it is worth the wait. Because at this point, we're just building up to a number of people meeting up in Hooper County for this bloodbath that Jim was talking about. Because on one hand, when we see this commercial flight dealing with some crazy turbulence, which is caused by a problem with their cargo hold, we then quickly find out what this was as Vengeance just jumps out the back of this plane, spilling luggage everywhere. And as messed up as this is, we've seen other Banes do worse things to airplanes. But with Vengeance lands, we kind of get this funny moment as well too. Because there's this regular dude driving by in his truck and he sees her fall out of the sky, just crashing into the ground. And he is just looking at her like, now that's a woman right there. <laughs> but then he asks her, did she see that? Was that like a comet or something? And Vengeance is like, no. And he asks her if she's some kind of superhero or whatever, she's part of the Justice League. And again, she says no. Well, then he's like, well, dang, let me buy you a drink. And when he says that, she stops. But then she turns around, pulls him out of the truck and just tosses dude, taking his truck to where from there she then makes her way to the Sawyer estate. But as for Barbara and her plan, this thing falls apart quickly because it's not long before Cressida makes Barbara aware that she hasn't fooled her in the slightest. 
And much like Barbara had suspected before, Cressida knew that Barbara was watching her from the clock tower. But Cressida also lets her know that Barbara thinks she has all this figured out, but she really has no clue how deep this goes. And with hearing this, Barbara, she goes for her panic button. And Cressida tells her not even to bother because her talent has already taken control of Julia's plane. So Barbara can forget about the backup. And from here, Barbara's just like, why does the Court of Owls want to kill the Joker? And Cressida responds, because she told them to. And after that, Barbara then tries to ask why did they take her brother, but then our Resident Evil Mr. X looking guy, who again, thanks to you guys in the comments of the previous video, because when I was saying this dude looked like the guy from Resident Evil, and at first I was thinking Nemesis, but I was saying the one with the trench coat and the hat. And a few of you guys figured it out and helped me in the comments, and y'all was like, nah, you talking about Mr. X. And I looked it up and I was like, yep, that's the guy. That's the one I'm talking about. But when he steps in here, he suffocates Barbara, causes her to pass out. Which from here now lets us know that Jim is pretty much on his own with his plan. Which also includes the small team that he has in mind. But at this point with him flying to Texas with Harvey Bullock, he fills him in about everything he knows as far as vengeance, the Joker, and the Samson family. So now the both of them are caught up. Or should I say all three? Because then it's here where Gordon goes to the back of the plane and he's like, hey, I know Barbara told you to look out for me and I just need you to make sure that we don't get killed once we get off this plane. And it's right there where Cassandra Kane steps out because again, we knew that Barbara would have Cassandra follow Jim, even though Jim wasn't aware of who this person would be, but he knew they would be here. And initially when Cassandra steps out, it kind of seems like Gordon was expecting Spoiler to be there as well. And Cassandra's like, nope, just me. And in this moment, you guys got to forgive Jim and Harvey because they're not aware that for Cassandra Kane, when it comes to fighting, that she's beyond thorough. So when Harvey looks at her like, hey, she's just a quarter my size and he tries to hem her up. So then she's pretty much forced to give him a taste of what it's like to fight someone who's been trained since birth to be the perfect bodyguard for Raja Ghul. So to sum it all up, she just lets him know, yeah, she can fight. But also at this point, Jim's figured out because he hasn't heard from Julia telling him to back down and that itself lets him know that Julia and Barbara are in trouble. And so when Jim asks Cassandra how long ago did she lose contact with Julia, she tells him it's been three hours, which at this point, Jim had more or less figured because he would have heard something. And so from here, he then pulls out the red phone, knowing that now at this point, Cassandra's going to be the one to pick up. And right away, Jim tells her he knows that she has Barbara and Julia and that he'll be landing soon at an airfield just outside of Hooper County. And when he does, they should definitely meet up. And at first, Cressida tells Jim that his daughter shouldn't have gotten involved. And at this point, they don't require his services any longer. But Jim tells her, I think you'll find that you do because he knows who was behind A-Day. Which from there, with him saying that, it has Cressida shook. But then she's like, fine, we'll meet in an hour. And for Gordon, after hanging up, he then tells Cassandra that we gotta do this right or a lot of people are gonna die. And so an hour later, when Jim steps off his private jet, he's just telling Cressida how it's gonna go. To where first and foremost, he's gonna have Harvey take his daughter and Julia back on their jet and fly them to Gotham City. And as soon as that plane takes off, then they can have their conversation. Which initially has Cressida like, who's this guy I think he is? He's really reaching right now. But Jim lets her know if the person in charge wants the end game that they are expecting to play out, then Jim has to know for certain that his daughter is safe. Because if she isn't, he's gonna burn this whole thing to the ground. To where then nobody's gonna get what they want. And with hearing this Cressida, she begins to respond to where then Mr. X whispers something in her ear. <laughs> and I'm just calling him Mr. X at this point. But with her hearing this, she changes what she was going to say. And she tells Jim that Barbara and Julia, they can go back to Gotham, but her talent must go with them. Which from here allows the girls to get on the plane with Harvey, but also with this talent tagging along as well. But as soon as they get on the jet and they take off, making their way to Gotham, Cassandra then jumps out and she puts this talent to sleep, which in a way played out as a bit of a bonus because now the James Gordon Jr. talent is with Barbara. Even though at this point we're not really sure if this is actually James Gordon Jr. back from the dead, or perhaps even a James Gordon Jr. clone conspiracy. For that, we'll just have to wait and see. But back down on the ground after the plane is taken off, Cressida tells Jim like, okay, you got what you wanted. The game board is cleared. And right then Jim's like, you know what? From here forward, I'm going to start speaking to him directly. And it's here where Jim tells Mr. X that he never bought the whole idea of him actually being dead, even with vengeance running around, but it only hit him when he stepped back and looked at all the pieces because this was never a Joker plan. It was a Bane plan because Bane has been Mr. X this whole time. And it was Bane who orchestrated A-Day, leaving the fake body, faking its death, and setting all these things in motion. And I'll say this right now, from like the first video, we figured this out. The Spillmonger Investigation Corporation, like we knew who it was. But also, I just imagine in this moment that Bane is just like, 
Ah, oh, Mr. Gordon, you figured it out, haven't you? <laughs> like in the Bane voice. Because we know there's a number of ways that he could have just cut Jim as a loss. Or he could have just made another diversion to keep Jim doing what he wanted him to do. But instead, I believe that Bane wanted to see if Jim could figure this out. And not as his original plan, but once it got to a certain point. But yeah, it's official. Bane is still alive. And Jim Gordon has solved for X. Mr. X. Alright, so for this one, we're jumping back in, of course, after the huge reveal where we finally found out who orchestrated this whole fiasco. As far as framing the Joker for A-Day, luring vengeance out in the public eye, while also setting up the Samson family in the process. But on top of us getting this reveal and finding out that this was a Bane plan the whole time, I also noticed that a ton of you guys had questions as far as how could Bane be here and also be within the issues of Task Force Z at the same time. So I want to take a minute and talk about that real quick and not even a minute because initially when you guys asked I kind of played with the idea that oh this was just one of the bodies that Bane had left behind in order to sell the idea that he was actually dead like we'd seen during A-Day with the body that was left at Arkham deceased after what appeared to be a Joker attack but in Task Force C issue 10 you'll find that they've made a clear distinction that the Bane that's been running around with Jason Todd and the others on this new team, it is not the actual Bane. And also within issue 10, they go on further to express that he was created because someone wanted the world to believe that Bane was dead, which for the most part has been explained throughout the Joker series, but I can understand the frustration of a lot of people waiting for this answer. But at the same time, I also understand that they were waiting to give this reveal until after the real Bane showed up in the Joker series. And they waited a good while after that. But nonetheless, we got our answer Answer, and that's why there's more than one Bane running around. But with getting into this one, we head back down to Hooper County, Texas, with the Samson family preparing this huge dinner. And it's not just the Samson family here, but it's also others who are filthy rich who just happen to share the same appetite in people. But the main course here isn't just anybody. But like we'd seen, it's the Joker, who hopefully they don't plan a spit roast because that would just be inappropriate. And I mean, they crossed that line years ago, but you know what I'm saying. But we're shown here rather quickly that this is set up to be a big deal. Because when Sawyer Samson shares a few words with everyone here, he reminds them how Billy's sacrifice afforded them this lifestyle. But also how years ago Sawyer had made a deal with the network who he just refers to as making the deal with the devil. But because Sawyer had made the plans with Billy having to go away, like they really didn't have a choice, that it was done in a way to where Billy would be beyond comfortable for the rest of his days. But because Billy's life was taken by who Sawyer believes to be the Joker, tonight is the night that the Samson family gets their revenge by going back to their savage ways, getting their hands dirty, and having clown for dinner. But of course with the Joker just sitting in the cage getting ready to get cooked, you know he gotta have some fun with the chef. And it's all fun and games at first until the chef throws hot coals on the Joker to where then the Joker kind of calms down like okay maybe I'm pushing it a little bit too much. But really the Joker was just trying to tell the chef that he's a better cook than him. Remember that. But at a moment's notice it's here where they then hear a big boom outside. And it's here where we find that vengeance has arrived. And she looks pissed because she's been on her way here since like three issues ago. To where on top of that, she's traveled by some unconventional and uncomfortable means. But seriously, with her coming here, she's repurposed her mission to where now her motivation is to kill the Joker for Jim Gordon. And at this point in time, Vengeance still believes that Jim's dead. So when she arrives here, man, she turns it up. And with doing so, she makes her entrance by setting their oil wells on fire. But right off the bat, with the Sawyer family, they're rich, so you know they got security. And when the security sees vengeance, of course they go after her, thinking that she's just some lunatic dressed like a Mexican wrestler, until she punches a jeep that was probably going like 40 miles an hour. And after that, she just tears right through these guys. But also with vengeance making this entrance that was anything but subtle, one of the security guys goes in and he tells Sawyer what's going on, and it's here where Sawyer tells his family and the guest that they're having dinner and a show, so they should grab something sharp and head outside to meet their unannounced guest. But really, this is one of those things where it's really like, what, 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 what are they gonna do? Like, did anybody tell them what happened to the Jeep? Cause had they seen her punch that Jeep, they'd know she had hands. And someone who can do that, you're not finna stop them with a butter knife. But then it's here where Sawyer tells Buddy to handle this. So Buddy runs up on Vengeance and she punches his head clean off of his shoulders. One shot, flawless brutality. Yo, like she popped Buddy's top and it was a wrap. And that right there is the end of Buddy. He's done. 
And when Sawyer sees this, the look on his face is priceless, bro. But from here, vengeance, she goes through these guys. Even with the number of them stabbing her, she still tears through them quite easily. But also, some of these guys, like this, this lady right here, you can just tell by the look in her eyes. Like the look of the lack of confidence. She knew at this point that this was a bad idea. And whether she knows this because Buddy's head still ain't hit the ground yet, I don't know. But either way, you can tell the peer pressure got to her and she's just out here doing what she saw everybody else doing. But just after this, while all the other guests are getting maimed, we find Vicky holding Buddy's head while grieving the way that he went out so viciously. But Sawyer lets her know that they can't stay here. They gotta get moving. And he don't care if she brings the head with her. But they've got to move from here and make their way to the panic room so he can reach out to the network and get them to sort this out. And when this happens, Vengeance, she sees Sawyer and Vicky go back inside. She also notices the cage next to the grill that's open, and she puts it together really quick that this is likely where the Joker was. But I also want to point out here with Vengeance being a clone of Bane, I definitely wouldn't say that she's a one-to-one, -one because strength-wise, regardless of what we've just seen, Bane is a lot stronger. Make no mistake. And as far as tactical planning, she's not even close. But even still, that doesn't mean that she can't assess the situation. And really, what we're being shown here throughout this Joker series as far as what Vengeance can do, really is just a stripped down version or portion of who Bane is. And I really think that most people just kind of only know Bane as this really strong dude who broke Batman's back. But Bane is so much more than that. Because over the years, he's shown to be a strategist that'll get you with the long game. But at his core, and I would say more than anything else, Bane is a fighter and a survivor. Because that's all he's known from when he was a child. And with Vengeance, the fighting part of Bane, as well as the Venom, those are really the only things that make up who she is. As well as the years of experience that she lacks that Bane had actually went through. Throughout Nightfall or Bane of the Demon, Endgame, City of Bane, or even more notably Vengeance of Bane which was a look at his earlier years growing up in prison to where for Bane we saw like with him being born as an inmate as a young child he had to deal with a lot early with older inmates trying to use him to steal stuff because he was so little to where also you had moments of him overcoming his fear of bats but ultimately these experiences made Bane they crafted his identity and for him even from the time that he was a young boy these things set Bane on the path of realizing who he would become a physical and mental paragon the living embodiment of human superiority and I just wanted to mention this as a reminder, because for Vengeance, who may share the DNA of Bane, but aside from that, she lacks the understanding of who she actually is and where that's going to take her. So it's like she shares a portion of his power, and at times she might even move like him. But there's still quite a distance between Vengeance and Bane. And as we move forward, we're being shown how she's only that one part of him with one objective on her mind. Which is something that's going to play an important role later on. But with Vengeance choosing at this point to continue to pursue Joker, one dude tries to hit her with a sneak attack, so she disarms him pretty quickly. But as she pursues the Joker, we then find that the Joker is taking the chef, and he's made good on his word to show that chef that the Joker is a better cook. And I mean, for me, it's, it's things like that. Like, you can't tell me that's not funny. Like, the way that the Joker commits to following a joke through sometimes. Like, sometimes it's only messed up, but sometimes it's messed up and it's funny. Like, actually funny. But at this point, with Vengeance catching up with the Joker, he tries to pull a Dave Chappelle, you know, knock something over and just take off, <laughs> but it doesn't work. But then it's here where Vengeance takes a moment to tell the Joker why she needs to kill him. Or at the least, she tries to. And the Joker tells her, like, why should he even listen? Because as far as he's concerned, it's not that deep. Because like, okay, they made you in a vat, they turned you into a weapon, but even still, they live in a world where there's flying aliens and robots from the future. So the Joker tells Vengeance, in comparison to that, you're nothing special. And in addition to that, she's a knockoff because she's more or less a we got Bane at home made flesh. And he tells her when it comes down to it, when she kills him, all people are going to say is that some random chick punched the Joker to death in Texas. But with the Joker saying this, like we know that vengeance, she doesn't care about the recognition. But with the Joker saying these things, for one, he's not wrong. And at the same time, for vengeance, it strikes a nerve because she lacks identity. But the Joker continues, even though she's punching the teeth out of his mouth in between like every sentence. But he tells Vengeance that she needs meaning. There's no meaning here. And if she kills the Joker, regardless of how she justifies it, she's still doing what she was programmed to do. But then on top of this, this is where the Joker goes too far. Because he goes on to tell her she's a nobody, she's a non-person, and she was made in a tube about a year ago, so that technically makes her a baby. So then the Joker's like, wait, no, I hope that's how people remember it that the Joker was killed by a giant baby. And with hearing this, Vengeance is like, that's it. And in this moment where she goes to give Joker's head the buddy treatment, someone grabs her arm from behind, saying no. And it's here where we find that Bane, as well as Jim Gordon, have made their way to Texas. As Bane tells Vengeance, hello daughter, 
it's time that we spoke because vengeance has a lot to learn and daddy's here to teach it. All right, so in the last talk, we had seen Vengeance make her way down to Hooper County, Texas, and immediately upon her arrival, she had made a bloodbath out of the Samson clan and friends, leaving Vicky and Sawyer Samson to be some of the only survivors out of the family and dinner guests, who from there didn't stick around with Sawyer pulling Vicky into the panic room. And as we get into this one, I want you guys to keep in mind that from here, the events that we are seeing taking place in Hooper County, and really from the time that Vengeance had finally got her hands on the Joker, for her only then to be stopped by Bane, that from here we're entering into a space where only a handful of people are actually here to know what happened. And we'll jump back into what exactly happened in just a moment. But with how this is done, we actually jump in three weeks later, where we find Jim Gordon getting ready to undergo interrogation from Chief Detective Isabella Hollows from Interpol who we had seen before in issues 6 through 8, when initially she showed up and had taken Jim into custody because his fingerprints were all around the four dead scientists at the sketchy cloning lab, but at that time she had expressed that she was really trying to get more information on the network. And if you guys remember at the time, rather quickly between the two, there was a lot of flirting going on. Sparks were flying, they were looking in each other's eyes, until Vengeance showed up and she ripped Isabella's arm off. And really from there, Jim and Isabella kind of lost touch. Um, yeah. And I mean, Isabella did get her arm back, like it's stitched back on, but the spark that was initially lit between these two, it's gone. But really it's through the scope of Isabella who immediately tells Jim to address her as Chief Detective Hollows, cause it's strictly professional at this point. But it's with her that we find that she's trying to figure out what exactly happened at the Samson family compound. And really from here throughout to the conclusion of this, we're gonna be jumping back and forth between the scope of everyone else who wants to know what happened and the scope of Jim Gordon who knows what actually happened. So we're gonna be doing that dance a little bit for this one in our next talk about the conclusion. But Jim just lets her know when he got there, he found Vicky and Sawyer Sampson, as well as body parts being served for dinner, and that's when he called the local authorities. And while Jim's here, this other detective tries to press him, talking about, well, how did you know the Sampson family was cannibals? And Jim just tells him that he knows the same way that the whole world knows now, which was because everywhere you looked at the compound, they were serving up faces and fingers as delicacies, amongst a bunch of other unmentionables. And not to mention upon Sawyer's arrest, he shouted at the police officers that he was going to eat them alive. So really for the most part, Jim is just putting on the front that he only knows what the public knows. So when Isabella asks if he saw vengeance at the Samson compound, Jim's just like nope. And when she shows him a picture of Bane, saying that one of the survivors claimed to have seen him there. And Jim looks at the picture and he's just like, well I thought Bane was dead. And then she puts down a picture of the Joker and Jim says nothing. And right away she loses it because she knows Jim was following the Joker for months. She knows the Samson family took the Joker at some point and dragged him down to Hooper County, Texas with the intention to eat him. She knows the Joker was there when Jim got there. And what she really wants to know is if Jim killed the Joker. So she asks him directly and Jim says nothing. But even with Jim not telling Detective Howells the whole story, we still see him think back to how the events had unfolded. And this is what takes us back to the moment where Bane stopped Vengeance from killing the Joker. And like we had seen right away, Bane is like, no, he's not gonna allow Vengeance to do this. And initially she's shocked because she didn't even know that the original Bane was still alive. But also with Bane stopping Vengeance from doing this, she sees this as Bane taking away this moment from her. So immediately she demands that Bane explains himself. And right away we find that he's willing to do so, but he wants Vengeance to calm down before he teaches her why she shouldn't kill the Joker. But she refuses to calm down and she goes straight for Bane, only to truly find out what strength is when he catches her face first. And really with how this is going down, it's not like Bane just wants to beat the mess out of Vengeance for no reason, though it may very much seem that way. But really what's happening here is that Bane, he sees himself in vengeance. And for that reason, he knows her potential. And it's more the case to where he wants to help her reach the fulfillment of that potential. And one of the first lessons he tells her is that she has a child's understanding of strength. And that's what makes her weak. And he points out something to vengeance that she's missed this whole time. And he tells her her masters have programmed her well because she thinks that she's resisting the programming by fulfilling the mission that they sent her to do. And it's true, because this whole time, Vengeance, she's wanted to break away from the programming. She wants to be free, but at the end of the day, how do we know that the scientists at Santa Prisca, that they didn't compensate for her rebellion? So that now, with her wanting to kill the Joker, for Jim Gordon instead, thinking that it's her making her own decision, when really, it's just her programming finding another way to get the original job done. And Bane's not gonna allow himself 
his clone or his daughter to go through that you know however you may see vengeance and really it's here where we're seeing bane tell vengeance that he wants to see her prove real strength by showing that she's strong enough to resist the programming but also while this is going on the joker he tries to slip away in the middle of all the commotion but jim's not having that and it's here we find jim take the joker to meet cressida so that he can end this once and for all but cressida is a lot closer than you would imagine because at this time she's already inside the house using the advanced technology provided by the court of owls in order to hack into sawyer samson's safe room and of course when the joker hears court of owls he's like oh this is getting better because again a lot of this he had just pieced together through a Assumption. But even still, the Joker's not fully aware of who all the players are. And it's at this time when the Joker asks who exactly Cressida is and why does she want him dead. But in the larger picture, for one, Cressida, she doesn't necessarily want the Joker dead. And though she finds the Joker distasteful, this is never really about getting the Joker killed. And it's here where Cressida tells the Joker that she's the daughter of Sebastian Clark previous grandmaster of the court of owls who was overthrown and who at one point had tried to get his power back by teaming up with bane which didn't work but for years this caused cressida to live in fear hiding from the court of owls and from the global network and she had dreamed to have the opportunity one day to tear the network down but she knew she couldn't do it alone but while cressida's father was headmaster he had taken a keen noticing to the new cloning projects thinking that it would be a valuable resource to creating new talents but the generals at santa prisca they bid higher because they wanted it more because the general at Santa Prisca, they had their own issue. They had tried to control Bane through mental conditioning, but mentally he was too strong and it didn't work. So after that, they wanted him dead because they had been working on a new Bane, Project Vengeance. And for the generals at Santa Prisca, this was the Bane that they could control. And they had planned that upon the death of the original Bane, he would become a martyr and that would be the perfect time for them to debut Vengeance, this new version of Bane that they could control. So for Cressida, with her having this sensitive information, she needed to take it to somebody who can form a plan that could do serious damage to the network. So with her taking this information to Bane, this is how he faked his death on A-Day, leaving the clone of himself dead, which again is why we got a fake Bane running around in Task Force Z. But on top of that, to make sure that this plan did not just fall apart, they needed to make it seem like this was someone else's plan, which is how this whole thing got pinned on the Joker. And with hearing this, it makes Cressida and Bane's motives clear. She has it out for the Court of Owls and the network. And Bane wants to tear down the system that's kept his captors in power for so long. But even still, the Joker is curious about what Jim wants out of all this. And it's here where again, Jim makes a reference to back when he first joined the force. And again, he remembers a conversation that he had in a bar in Chicago. When at the time, it was Jim as a young cop talking to an old cop. And that old cop told Jim about the time that he had let a truly evil man slip through his fingers who had later went on to kill more people. And that old cop told Jim that if he's ever in that same situation, when he sees evil, he should aim for the head. And in response to the Joker, that's what Jim does. But then all of a sudden, vengeance just smashes through the wall like the Kool-Aid man, because Bane still hasn't gotten through to her, and she still wants to kill the Joker. But fortunately, at this point, Cressida has hacked her way into the safe room. So right away, her, Jim, and the Joker run inside and lock the door, which now places the three of them in there with Vicky and Sawyer Samson, which from here pretty much takes the story in two different directions, with the next issue following Jim, and this one giving us more or less the conclusion to the story arc of Vengeance. Like, this is pretty much it for her. And I don't mean like in a grim way, but more so in relation to the overarching story and her involvement in the Joker series for the foreseeable future. But what we come to find out with Vengeance is that through this conversation with Bane, he's able to get Vengeance to open her eyes and realize that her real enemy is also their mutual enemy, who in their case is the generals at Santa Prisca because Bane wants to get rid of their whole entire cloning operation. So him and Vengeance head down there to do just that. And from there, we're not really told what's next for Bane and Vengeance. But also it's hinted to us that even with them taking down Santa Prisca's cloning facility, that it's possible that other clones like Vengeance have already been made and they're out there in the wild. So it'll be fun to see who that is and what they're up to. But with how this is done, we jump forward in time again, where we find Jim back in Gotham and no longer being interrogated by Isabella. But not long after he gets back, he has a conversation with Barbara, who calls her dad and more or less tells him two words. He knows. So Jim heads home and he pours two drinks because he knows he has some explaining to do. Because going from here, there's only one issue left. And with how this is done, the question that still remains is did Jim Gordon kill the Joker? And that's a question that we'll talk about in the next one. As Jim tells Batman what exactly happened in that safe room, as far as who made it out alive and who didn't.
Alright, so with getting into the conclusion, we jump back in with Jim Gordon who's made his way back to Gotham and back to his apartment just after his daughter Barbara told him the two words, he knows, which right there let Jim know that he had to get home, pour a couple drinks for himself because Jim knew when Batman got there, he was going to have a lot of explaining to do because at this point Batman's only aware that Jim has been hired to kill the Joker in addition to a few other details. So from here, Jim's got to fill Batman in about how everything played out as well as how it truly ended, which is the part that we're still waiting on. So with this one, it's going to be much like what we had seen when Jim was talking to Chief Detective Hallows when we went through the narrative of what he remembered and what he wasn't telling Chief Detective Hallows. But in this case for Jim, he's starting from the top. And unlike the experience that we'd seen with Interpol, Jim is telling Batman everything. But with Batman getting here and asking Jim, where's the Joker? Jim, of course, has been through a lot, so he's got to decompress. Plus, it's the conclusion, after all. And James Tynion has to run the clock. But it works out for us, because it kind of gives us a recap of everything that's happened. Before we get down to how this really ended. But with Jim having this talk with Batman, it reminds him of one of their first conversations about the Joker. And even though Jim expresses that he can't remember their exact first conversation, but at this point, the conversation that he remembers most vividly is one that Jim had had with Batman on a snowy rooftop. Earlier on, what Jim had believed that the Joker was going to be somebody that they would catch, throw an Arkham and just forget about. But with Jim not remembering the fine details of this conversation, he does remember that at the time, Batman had gone head to head with the Joker at least once. And even then, Batman knew that he was up against something different. And it was that night that Jim had noticed a wariness in Batman that he hadn't seen before. And even now with Jim looking back, he'd noticed that things had never been the same since that night. But with Batman asking Jim, where's the Joker? Jim tells him that he honestly doesn't know. And after that, when Batman asked Jim if he killed the Joker, Jim tells him, in the beginning, that's exactly what he was hired to do. And he admits that the reason he didn't come to Batman at first is because he didn't know if he wanted to be stopped. And Jim admits that from then till now, he had a number of opportunities to kill the Joker, both indirectly and directly. But before jumping into the details, Jim tells Batman that they'd known each other a long time. And because of that, Jim deserves the opportunity to at least be able to explain himself. But even with Jim saying this, you can tell that Batman's patience is wearing kind of thin because 70% of this issue is a long-winded answer to a yes or no question which again i can understand because it gives us a refresher because a lot has happened so for us most of this is like jim giving us a summary of what's taking place in addition to filling us in on how it actually ended but to start this off jim asks batman if he's familiar with the network and batman admits that he's heard rumors and he's brushed up against edges of it in his work but for him that's as far as it goes and it's here where jim tells batman that today their organization is going to start to fall apart in their hands which then has batman like all right jim what'd you do and so it's here where Jim tells Batman that he had met their main scientist, who was a legit mad scientist, but he had revealed with the network making clones, they were trying to create a new generation of costume villains that they would be able to control. Because the network, they see the battles between costume heroes and villains as something that's useful to them. Because for the longest time, it's distracted the heroes from the work that the network has been doing in the shadows for the most richest and depraved people. And Jim goes on to tell Batman that for the last couple of decades, the network has spent that time luring the most dangerous costume criminals to these different little resort spas where they can stay off the radar of both heroes and the authorities. And on top of that, they have amassed the DNA of some of the most dangerous people on the planet so that they could splice together and create these monstrosities that would be conditioned to follow their orders. And it's here where Jim goes on to tell Batman about vengeance, because like we'd seen, she's a product of this science, which originated with the network and later was used by the leaders in Santa Prisca. But as Jim continues, he tells Batman how vengeance is a clone of Bane, as well as how capable she is. And he tells Batman, just imagine someone like her programmed to kill a city's hero, or imagine someone like her just unleashed. And while she's wrecking everything and causing chaos, the network is just using this distraction so that they can continue to carry out their work. But even with Jim saying this, we still don't know how many other clone concoctions are out there who may be a copy of one or even multiple heroes or villains. And on top of that, with these multiple labs having been destroyed, we still know that someone out there still has their hands on some of these samples. 
But after talking about vengeance in the cloning program, Jim then goes on to tell Batman about Cressida Clark, because without her, Jim would have never known about any of this. Because Cressida is the one who had set these recent events in motion. Like it really started with her. Because for Cressida, for the longest time, she's wanted to take down the network and the Court of Owls. And mainly because, like we'd seen before, she was doing this in order to get revenge on the organization that cast out her father and destroyed her life. And with Cressida having all this sensitive information about the network and the Court of Owls, as well as her motive to seek revenge, this is what led her to take all of this to Bane, who had known her father before. Both Cressida telling Bane about vengeance. This is why they framed the Joker and caused the whole 8A incident so that they could cover their tracks and move freely. But also with doing this, Bane was hoping that he would draw out his daughter, Vengeance. And Jim goes on to tell Batman that this is where they brought him in, because they needed someone who could put together the larger mystery and expose the network. And to get Jim to do this, all they had to offer him was money and the Joker's head. And even now, Jim admits that he's not proud that it, it actually worked. Like they knew exactly what they needed to do to will him in, and he went for it. So of course, like we'd seen, Jim went on to hunt down the Joker, but with doing so, in the process, he was unaware that he was actually uncovering the network. But then Jim goes on to say that it wasn't until he was in Belize where he got an up close look at the Joker's frustration because a target got put on his back and the Joker wanted to know why. And at this point, Jim, he wanted to know too. Because if the Joker actually did this, he wouldn't lie and say that he didn't. But then it's here where Jim asks Batman if they can go to the roof because he feels like he's a bit more honest up there where he can see the city. And it's on their way up there where Jim then continues the story. And he goes on to say that at some point the Joker had figured out that the network had taken some of his DNA and that they were going to use it to create Jokers that they could control and weaponize. And Jim tells Batman that he'd seen some of these experiments himself, these gruesome and failed experiments. But like we'd seen, the Joker had set up for vengeance to find the truth about herself in the lab in Paris, which at the time is what led to vengeance going off the rails. But nonetheless, this led to what Cressida wanted, with the lab getting burned and being destroyed, and it also fed into what Bane wanted with vengeance learning the truth. And for Jim, the way he looked at it, the job was just getting done. It didn't matter how, or even if it was a coincidence, until later when he found out that Bane was a part of this, and then from there, he really didn't look at much of this as any coincidence. But then it's here where Jim goes on to tell Batman, after he found out that Bane was involved, that it was around this time where Barbara got in over her head, alongside with Julia Pennyworth. And it's from here where Jim tells us something that we don't know, because from here forward, it's new info. Because we kind of got left hanging from issue 12, when Jim made a deal with Bane and Cressida for them to let Barbara and Julia go, back on his plane with Harvey Bullock, to where Cressida agreed, but she told him they had to take the talent with them. Which they did, but like we'd seen, Cassandra Kane was still there, and she attacked the talent as soon as he got on the plane. And if you know anything about Cassandra Kane, you already know that she gets down. But of course with this happening, this wasn't any regular talent. And as it turned out, in this moment we actually got the reveal that it confirmed Barbara's suspicions from issue 9, when she identified the talent who had attacked her in the clock tower, to be a DNA match for her deceased brother, James Gordon Jr. And it's from here where we find out through Jim, that Barbara had taken James back with her to Gotham, while also telling him that she's gonna try and fix him and bring him back for real. And then just after this, we pick up from the cliffhanger that we were given in issue 14, when Cressida, Jim, and the Joker went inside the safe room to get away from vengeance. But with doing this, they were then trapped in a room with Vicky and Sawyer Sampson, which you would think would be kind of a out of the frying pan into the fire kind of thing with the Sampsons, but Jim just ended up knocking out Sawyer while he was going for the Joker, and that was about it. And from there, they just tied up Sawyer and Vicky. But then it's here where the Joker asked Jim to pick up where he left off with that story. When Jim was younger, an old cop told him to aim for the head, but this time, instead of putting the gun back to the Joker's head, Jim tells the Joker that he's gonna wait here for the media to show up so he can tell them the truth, and after that, he tells the Joker that the Joker's going to help him find all of the resorts that he's visited over the years. But then the Joker lets Jim know, like, the plan sounds great and everything. Like, I imagine the Joker would love to show Jim around and show him all the resorts. But it's here where the Joker tells Jim that the plan sounds nice, but if he wanted to keep the upper hand, he probably shouldn't have put the Joker in a safe house in Texas that just has guns everywhere. And this is the moment that turns the situation on his head. Because it's here where Joker tells Jim to put his gun down, nice and easy. And it's here where the Joker's like, who am I going to kill? I got to kill somebody. And first, he considers Sawyer and Vicky Sampson. But then he's like, no, because they're about to lose everything and he wants them to live and see that. 
but from there he looks at Cressida and Jim. And at this point he's on the fence deciding if he should go for the person who set him up and put a target on his back or should he go for Jim, who the Joker had thought was starting to learn how things worked at this point. But instead, like Jim said before, he's going to the media and to the authorities and the Joker's really just tired of that same old loop. But then it's here where Jim tells the Joker if he wanted to kill him, then he would have done it a long time ago. And with hearing this, the Joker, he agrees. So he then starts to make his way out of the room. But then just before he leaves the room, he stops like, oh yeah, I almost forgot. Like I said, somebody's gotta die. And the Joker turns around and he shoots Cressida. And it's really a shocking moment because you would think that the Joker would have just left. But nope, unfortunately, he's a man of his word. But before Cressida passes, she sends Jim the money that she'd promised. And though it's not the full amount and we're not told exactly how much, but she tells Jim that it's enough to keep the fight going. And just before she goes, she tells Jim to promise her that he'll tear it all down. And in response, he tells Cressida that he'll do everything in his power. But after this, Jim tells Batman that he went to Isabella and Interpol because he didn't want to get the American authorities involved because there's a good chance that the network has him on payroll. But aside from that, Sawyer Sampson, he's given up all kind of details on everybody because he's old and bitter enough to throw everybody under the bus. And like we'd seen before with Vengeance and Bane, they made their way to Santa Prisca to tear down their cloning facility limb from limb. And aside from that, the Joker, he's in the wind. But with the seeing Jim tell Batman all the details, from here, we do see him keep in touch with both Isabella and Harvey Bullock to keep the progress moving on shutting down the network, but also Jim calls Barbara to tell her that he'll help to try to get James Gordon Jr. to a place of some type of normalcy where he can have the chance of having a future. And after this, we then see Jim Gordon go back inside and go to bed and for the first time in a long time, sleep soundly without being kept up at night thinking about the Joker. And I mean, it would be messed up if the Joker crept through the window and was like, oh, forgot one thing, Jimbo. <laughs> but no, it's not that kind of story. But nonetheless, I will say it was a very interesting and unexpected ending with us going through a ton of twists just to get here. But also I'll say, as far as this Joker series as a whole, for me, the ride was a lot more fun than the destination. And I'll leave it at that. But I'm curious to know what you guys think in the comments. And before we go, I want to give a special shout out to our new patrons, Robert A and Aaron V. Special thanks to you guys and all the patrons for supporting the channel. And for anyone who's new here who wants more information on how to support the channel, I got a link below so you can go to patreon.com slash dopespill. But that'll do it for this one, guys. Let me know your thoughts down in the comments below, and we'll do it again on the next one. All right, later.